So we are live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we welcome you all uh, on Auto TV uh, for the eighth edition of Pune Spine Weekend Meet the Masters. Uh, after the uh, first uh, session yesterday, which was brilliantly uh, seen by viewers from all over the world, uh, today we are having the second day and the last day of the meeting. As we all know, this is a very interesting and interactive session where we have debates, we have challenging uh, good, bad and ugly cases and we have non-academic talks. Today's special attraction for non-academic talks is Dr. Abhay Nene will be talking on anything but spine. Dr. Bala, uh, the neurosurgeon from uh, Chennai, will be talking on Doc Brunner, how we can uh, think about rehab, what we are doing and what we can do. And Dr. Himanshu Gulkarni is talking about the challenges in running an individual uh, center in periphery. Uh, these are the interesting topics for all of us. And apart from that, we have interesting debate uh, between cervical disc replacement versus fusion and four interesting topics. As, uh, as it will come, we will talk about all the speakers, which are uh, all national acclaimed faculties. And uh, the chair for this uh, symposium is uh, our own Sajan uh, Hegde sir from Chennai. And I really uh, don't want to talk much about Sajan sir, as we all know, he's a stellar uh, fact, uh, stalwart uh, in Indian subcontinent, or we can say worldwide. And he's an ex-president of a Association of Spine Surgeons of India. I welcome you, Sajan, sir, for today's uh, uh, Spine Weekend. And uh, we thank you for giving this uh, time uh, for us. Uh, and then we have uh, Dr. Pradyuman uh, Pairai Turkar, a senior faculty from Pune uh, region, will be uh, saying a few words about uh, today's uh, webinar. And we have Pune Orthopedic Society's great support, Dr. Chetan Pradhan and Dr. Swapnil Bise, will be sharing uh, the uh, dais for the inaugural uh, a few minutes and uh, we uh, go on with the uh, uh, straight away our uh, symposium. My colleagues Ajay Kotari uh, will be here, Dr. Siddharth Ayer and Pramod Bilare, we all will be uh, with you all for any questions you can directly message to us and we will uh, take it in account. Thank you. Uh, I would request Sajan sir to say a few words. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be associated with anything that uh, is organized by the Sancheti Group of Spine Surgeons. My association goes back a very, very long time, ever since our dear departed uh, colleague, Ketan, and uh, uh, we have had very close relationships. I have had wonderful times at Sancheti, operating, talking about uh, all the new things that are happening uh, uh, in, in spine. And it is a pleasure to be here. I do not want to say too much. Let's start straight away with the program. Thank you, Sajan, sir, uh, for uh, your, your uh, initial uh, supporting comments. And uh, we all miss Ketan for sure. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, request Dr. Pradyuman to say a few words. Dr. Pairai Durga. Pradyuman, you are muted. You are muted. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Shailesh. Uh, I think it's a fitting tribute to Ketan that you are doing this fine weekend now in the eighth year now, which he started eight years ago. It's a really a heads off to all of you, and it's a fitting tribute to him. I welcome all on behalf of Pune Association of Spine Surgeons. Uh, the program over here is really quite interactive, is case-based debates, which is definitely much more in learning than in didactic lectures. So hopefully next year we all meet in person uh, for this. But at the same time, I would like to invite all of you for uh, in-person conference, the MISAPCON 2022, which we'll be holding from 18th of November to 20th of November. All are welcome. It is going to be a treat and one of the uh, spine conferences, first spine conferences, which is going to be held in person. So I welcome you all to Pune in November, the best time to be here. Thank you, Shailesh, and all the best. Thank you, Pradyum, for uh, this. Uh, and uh, we will move on with uh, Dr. 
so sapneel bise is the president uh, secretary of pune orthopedic society and a very dynamic uh, orthopedic surgeon he is doing a lot of academic as well as uh, clinical work i would like to request uh, dr sapneel uh, bise to say a few words on behalf of pos thanks shailesh uh, good evening everyone uh, respected academic chair dr sajan hegde convener dr shailesh uh spine weekend chairman dr parag sanchiti a very good evening uh, i remember i attended two years back uh, two three years back the spine weekend as a delegate where it was a physical meet in the sanchiti where ketan was con- and with the shailesh conducted and that same time the dr sajan also uh, was a academic chair it was very interesting and today i saw your program it was a very enthusiastic and uh, educational activity with the non academic talk also included so i all the best to all the speakers to continue the same legacy and we will as dr pradyumna said we will meet hopefully in physically next year so i will definitely look forward to it thank you very much thank you sapneel for giving time uh, in your busy schedule as you are doing too many academic programs on weekends as well and we move on with the first uh, interesting case uh, i would like to request uh, dr priyank patel who is practicing at uh, jupiter hospital thane as a uh, chief spine surgeon and at vr spine mumbai uh, dr priyank is a very dynamic uh, uh, spine surgeon and he is having special interest in spinal tumor we invite uh, priyank to open the shots over to you priyank good evening everyone Th- uh, thank you dr sailesh for having me here uh, without wasting a lot of time let me g- directly jump on to the case so this was a interesting case of spinal metastasis which had presented to us around 2 years back uh, this was a 43 year old female she presented with stiffness in the neck and just some paresthesias in the right upper limb her neck of motion uh, neck range of motion was restricted she did not have uh, any major neurological symptoms at the time of presentation she was a patient with a history of uh, thyroid meta thyroid cancer which had previously metastasized to the cervical spine and the sacrum so uh, some years back which was in 2012 uh, she had a posterior cervical debulking surgery which was done uh, along with a thyroidectomy and uh, and uh, as a adjuvant treatment she was given radio iodine therapy uh, a very important past history for this patient was at the time of primary surgery she had an injury of the right vertebral artery uh, which was managed at that time and then she survived so many years and this is how she presented with us so she was around 10 years into her uh, 10 years post her primary surgery around 8 her 8 years post her primary surgery where thyroid was removed she had a posterior cervical debulking surgery she presented at present with this type of an mri image and ct image showing that there was involvement of multiple cervical vertebrae uh, the anterior body had practically uh, disappeared uh, but however her clinic clinical presentation was just some neck stiffness and some right upper limb uh, paresthesias so uh, i would like to open up this discussion to the house as to how would we go ahead with this uh, patient important history is she has previously uh, had a cervical debulking surgery and a right sided vertebral artery was injured during the primary surgery how so, many years how many years was uh, the previous surgery so 2012 was when was her primary surgery done and we had taken her up in 2020 and uh, so, any prognostic things on the ca thyroid of what what was he was it a curative thing or it was something which no so so primarily only when she had presented she presented with primary involvement of the cervical spine where it was uh, where we came to know that uh, she had a primary in the cervical which had already metastasized but uh, with a complete thyroidectomy some debulking and radio iodine therapy she was in remission for so many years okay so, so this uh, is the these are the yeah. important points which we keep in mind when we take the decision as to how to progress 
so what is the opinion right now for the oncologist what are they saying means they can treat with some radio or Yeah. What so for so now, now uh, speaking to the oncologist, they are they are opinion is that uh, doc uh, she has a very good life expectancy uh, because thyroid is one of the good cancers which can be managed with medicines and with radio iodine therapy. Uh, one challenge was that when uh, when she presented to us, she had an infant. She she had a one year old child. So uh, one one challenge that comes with radio because that was the first obvious treatment by the oncologist that we give her a radio iodine therapy. But the problem is whenever you take a radio iodine therapy, you leak out certain radioactive dyes from your skin. That's why if you have an infant, they have to be kept away from you for at least three to six months at the time of therapy. That's why radio iodine therapy at that time was not that good uh, good of an option. wherein they then told us that now you'll have to deal with it in some other way uh, where we were told to manage the cervical spine and deal with that and uh, post everything else they'll manage with uh, with other modalities so for us the big challenge was do we tackle this type of a lesion uh, do we tackle this uh, surgically or do we just send her across for uh, for radiation the challenge again is that radiation uh, thyroid cancers are not very radio sensitive so what do we do in such a situation so uh, priyank uh, uh, one thing i would think of is uh, get a sin score assessment on this it, it looks like it might be a very poor sin score and second is because you say that there is a vertebral artery injury definitely a ct angio because without knowing what is the current status you might not be able to progress correct so we did the we did a ct angio and the ct angio showed that there was no revascularization the right uh, vertebral artery yeah, you was know you know you get sorry <laughs> yeah so based on that uh, uh, vertebral angio you will probably get an idea of you know what you are looking at in terms of surgery and, correct um, so so we had that information medical oncologist so says on that we cannot treat vertebral her. artery okay so if the medical oncologist says that we cannot treat her uh, with radio iodine anymore because of the infant then there are not much options left then uh, since it's uh, traditionally considered radio resistant unless and until uh, you do like an epidural separation you might not be able to get a good amount of external beam right now which is very close to the cord so i Correct. feel that looking at the wbb score you are looking at an anterior surgery again somewhere in the in the near future correct so so that so you are actually on the right track now the only thing that came into our head was that symptomatically patient really didn't have a lot of symptoms the only thing that she had was neck 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 uh, stiffness and right upper limb paresthesias uh, so you know and and she was previously operated in the anterior part for uh, for the thyroidectomy she had a radio iodine therapy posteriorly she had a big disaster during the first surgery so for us uh, with a patient who was not that bad uh, telling her to undergo a big surgery was uh, something that was holding us back and we had a mdm and we had a discussion with all the different specialists and what we thought that uh, in this situation uh, since the patient is radio resistant there is an option of sbrt sbrt is basically stereotactic body radiation therapy wherein concentrated beam of radiation falls on the tumor and even radio resistant tumors are known to respond to such a treatment so we had a discussion with the radiation oncologist and what they said is that if you are able to do a cord clearance just you know debulk the tumor a little bit uh, in that scenario uh, uh, they are okay for us to uh, they are okay to take the pa patient up for uh, radiation so what we did is we went through the posterior approach we went again through the right side see right side we did not have major anything major to lose the vertebral artery was anyways gone and uh, incidentally the soft tissue mass was maximally on the right side without disturbing anything else what we did is we went from the right side we started debulking the tumor and from the right we went anteriorly and took the tumor away from the cord and we did the good clearance uh, uh, posteriorly and then send the patient across for sbrt and uh, that's where the patient uh, was taken up for sbrt uh the story doesn't end here it, it's just the first part where a radio surgery followed by sb uh, clearance and uh, sbrt was done the patient did really well for 6 months 
both are you up. just did you just did just debulking of the tumor you did not just fix it posterior debulking of the tumor we went through a right sided approach okay. uh, so that the left sided vertebral artery is not at all you bothered mean patent, yeah. yeah and uh, and then the patient went across for sbrt now the good thing uh, in SBRT, may i yeah. step in of course why didn't you consider uh, because this is a very uh, an extremely uh, unstable situation why didn't you uh, decide to stabilize her at the time of the debulking it may have been better correct so that One. was also something that was also something which was on the plate the thing is that we didn't want to go anteriorly because of the scarring and all the issues uh, that we are going to face anteriorly posteriorly right sided there was nothing where we could stabilize it so the patient was living off on the left side uh, just a left sided lateral mass would have been a very poor fixation for this lady and uh, and sir if you would have tried to do left sided pedicle through fixation in a uh, in a lady with uh, only one vertebral artery that would have been risk to life that's why considering all the risk benefit we decided we'll just go through a uh, we'll just do a debulking but actually that's a very good uh, pointer that you have placed because then retrospectively we realized that primarily if you would have stabilized we would have been in a better situation because as soon as we uh, did the we did the yeah sidan like just the sin score i think or if you if you if we were to actually do assuming previous laminectomy is done so there is no tumor back you might have to consider that the post elements are quite redundant and Correct. it's a completely lytic lesion there is already kyphosis i think this is this is going to be bordering close to 10 or maybe even close to 13 i feel easily absolutely given actually uh, the tokoashi score was pro a very aggressive surgery because the patient had a good life expectancy and the sin score completely supported the fact that we need to stabilize the patient however the challenges of stabilization were still there that's why we decided against stabilization giving the patient the benefit that okay uh, the the posterior everything will hold up and we'll just do a uh, do a radiation because at the end of the day uh this is a lady who's already survived 8 years on metastasis and we didn't want her to go through help for just you know it, it's too much of risk to ask for a lady with just paresthesias but uh, what happened is 6 months after radiation uh up to 6 months she was doing really well but then she started deteriorating both in the right upper limb and in the right lower limb and she started getting myelopathy and uh, and what what dr sajan said and what uh, siddharth also uh, said the we we had the same issue post radiation the patient had further instability and the spine started breaking or toppling off uh, when we ended up doing the imaging we realized that the tumor was very well under control uh, but it was because of the instability and because of uh, the biomechanics the the uh, spine had fractured and it was kind of like a three column injury and the cord was at thread that's why she was uh, uh started presenting with weakness in both right upper limb and lower limb so now we have a lady over here who has instability in the cervical spine the tumor is well under control after the radiation so what do we do next i dr. still Sar think uh, go, go ahead if somebody yes sir dr sajan sir sir no, sorry no, no, go ahead go ahead sajan sir your opinion i still would consider a very aggressive uh, stabilization if necessary from uh, occiput to uh, uh, the, the the upper thoracic spine if only the the uh, the elements uh, the spinal elements at the tumor level are almost all gone so i would just bypass it with a longer fixation and i would also consider going anteriorly to remove debulk as much as possible and put in a cage uh, at, at whatever good bony levels that i get uh, depending on the length of uh, corpectomy i have to do put a, a longish cage and uh, hope for the best and of course support her with a philadelphia collar for whatever it is worth
so dr hartgaukar your opinion would you would you do something similar to like dr sajan front and back long three level oh, corpectomy think- now i think yes because this has to be stabilized and yes there is a th- thyroid surgery but we can definitely get a plane from opposite side right side is gone right vertebral is not functioning so we should take the advantage of that at least fix right side all screws c2 to c7 or uh, maybe uh, you know ki go up and uh, fix it up to c71 uh, long construct unilateral also can be a good idea you don't need to go on opposite side because you are just worried for that one vertebral and you can go in front anterior uh, column reconstruction plus right sided only instrumentation also should be okay anyone keen on a long fibula graft here in, or a cage can be priyan more yeah. was done so uh, so we actually the same thing the opinion of the house is what was going on in our head and because we had run out of all the options even the patient was ready to take the risk now the biggest challenge that we had was that uh, the patient had a very short neck anteriorly because she had kyphost and it was all scarred because of the previous surgery uh, the patient had only one sided uh, vertebral artery and the patient had a reasonable uh, uh, life expectancy so here what we did is first step we did a uh, we did a uh, we did a closed end end preemptive uh, vertebral artery stenting so we got the we got the interventional radiologist into the picture what they did is that the right sided vertebral artery which was still patent they they put a closed ended stent to it sorry the left side which was still patent they put a closed ended stent to it and then we went across posteriorly we did a occipital dorsal fusion and wherever we could find some bone on the right side we were able to put some lateral mass screws and dorsal pedicle screws but in the left side we were able to put pedicle screws at all levels and because we had already done a preemptive stenting we were not worried that our screws would cause some vertebral artery disaster uh, then we went across anteriorly and anteriorly we reconstructed with uh, a mesh cage filled in with cement and a long plate so this is basically what we did uh the patient is now two and a half years follow up and uh, she's holding off well and sh- so overall we have had a, a reasonably good result uh it's been more than two and a half years now she does not have any further recurrence which we need to deal with but the child has also grown so in case if she has some recurrence we are ready with the radioiodine therapy so that's basically from our case excellent very well done very well taken care of thank you so much sir it it's a great uh, execution and finally these are challenging cases you know absolutely it, incredible yeah retrospectively we always feel why you didn't do that time only fixation but we don't realize sometimes there can be oozing it can take a longer time for decompression debulking so many things come when it's actually in front of you and then you have to really have a very good team approach take everyone into account and take everyone's uh, inputs which uh, you guys have done priyank it's uh, it's a great learning for all of us any input uh, shailesh shailesh can i ask a question yes uh, priyank uh, how does a preemptive stenting helps uh, prevention of vertebral artery injury so basically uh, the the it's a closed ended stent and in case so what we did is we basically uh, were doing uh, we we started putting the screws under vision however the thing is that because the patient has only vertebral artery one vertebral artery any kind of damage to that vertebral artery will be a disaster for that patient so by putting a closed ended stent when we are actually putting in our feelers and we are t- taking it in case also if we are breaching the pedicle because the vertebral artery is stented from inside we get Nothing that hard more. resistance yeah. and the chance of vertebral artery injury uh, becomes less it's kind of negligible in that uh, scenario so but then this this stent is not metallic right it is a metallic stent okay uh, but then it, did you a, did, a, did you remove did you remove the stent, stent. did Sorry? you remove the stent did you remove no, the no, stent no no we let it be inside so but then i can't see that stent on no, the no. x-ray so the i i'll show you if i am i am i'll try to get the pointer but it is there it is there i'll uh, i one minute huh? maybe because of the contrast i'm not able to get it out can you see my pointer okay if you see this a little bit of shadow in this area that's that stent which we are seeing you see mm-hmm. this yes that that's that metallic stent which is there 
wonderful okay. priyank superb execution something new for all of us to learn stenting scenarios yes harpreet yeah harpreet yeah so priyank i just uh, i joined late actually but uh, excellent presentation and uh, it's a very difficult mind boggling case i was lost what to do but then you have a team of uh, excellent you know people so you have did a wonderful job my question is that once you have stent stented the vertebral artery now that patient will require a lot of uh, anticoagulants was that uh, thing was there or it it will not require any anticoagulant from the patient thing because not really sir it was not required in fact we did the stenting on one day and the second day we took the patient up for uh, the surgery and from their side there was no requirement of any anticoagulants okay like even now the patient is not on any okay thanks so gang one prayer from me all the pedicle screws which you have put i know you are a human robo but still uh, these were uh, navigation guided or free hand oh, no no it was free handed and this is where okay. i remember dr hadgaogar saying that if hey, at all we had a uh, you know a oam at that time um you know our arteries would have been a bit safe but this this we did free handed uh, no, i think yeah i mean yeah, sajan sir and guru raj uh, you will uh, echo if you have a navigation then uh, you don't need to do probably uh, the stenting i think that what do you think sajan sir yeah yeah i i am not too sure how much the stenting has has helped and uh, if there was to be uh, at all unfortunately an injury to the vertebral artery i don't think the stent would have made uh, being there or not being there would have made a big difference so i think it is all about uh, the care with which the pedicle screws were put that uh, finally worked well for the patient Perfect. one 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 question is why have you crossed the rods any reason particularly uh no 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 particular reason basically when we finally put the rods uh, with the lateral mass and the pedicle screws in such a way we were it was a little difficult to put straight rods but then we realized when it's crossing it's very simple so we just put it in that manner it's quite innovative great yeah <laughs> it was I just the way the rods were lining up with the pedicle screws and the occipital plate i think okay. if if we are able to do this cross rod technique it is actually more more stable situation that's so what I we think, realized uh, afterwards the pull out stent is going <laughs> no, no. to be more yeah. than the straight rods yeah guru raj if you want to say if you keep your hands like this and you cross it they are more stable yeah the pull outs yeah, yeah. so i think thank you uh, priyank for a wonderful case and a great start uh, we have uh, today at uh, as a uh, faculty with us we have dr vivek pinsent from uh, uh, kerala we have dr rahul choudhary from pune and dr palo bhatia also they are also with us and samir ruparel also is along with us so we have a lot of interactions and now we move on to the next interesting good bad ugly case and we have dr pramod lokande the uh, organizing secretary of misaf 2022 is pramod around pramod yes sir is there yeah yeah uh, hello good evening everybody yeah yeah so pramod yeah my... yeah i think it's not as interesting once priyank has started i could not match his caliber you know <laughs> <laughs> but uh, still i try to make uh, something uh, priyank i think you have to you know uh, stop sharing your screen first uh, i've done that i've stopped sharing done that okay yeah i just mu muted all uh, pramod you can uh, please uh, because there was some sound which was coming pramod you can unmute yourself and those who really want to interfere they can actually enter any time okay can you see the screen can you hear me yes 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 okay uh, the first case i think is uh, not as interesting as but the second one is you know the more interesting one or rather you know something which i have encountered for the first time so just to start with the you know flow the first case is for the younger generation maybe how to deal with certain things and uh, classical case of atlanto axial instability a 13 year old female very weak build and very weakly nourished you know most of these uh, girls or you know young boys because of the chronic compression of the upper cervical part uh, the medulla oblongata and the pons you know they 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 tend to uh, be weakly built and weakly nourished 
So she had bilateral upper and lower limb weakness, severe myelopathy, difficulty in walking, and unable to stand or walk since one month. Bladder was normal, and this is the MRI and flexion and extension. Uh, so it's open to the house. What is the normal? How do you approach such cases? Let's let's start with uh, Samir uh, and uh, Pallu Bhatia. I think the MRI, the dynamic MRI shows that during flexion, there's pinching of the cord, which is happening due to the dense. Um, so in this case, probably I would do a foramen magnum decompression, preoperative traction, and an occipital cervical fixation. Yeah, how many of you guys give traction in such cases? Because personally, I'm not a very keen fan of, you know, I'm not a very big fan of traction to be given pre-operatively in such cases. I think, uh, Hello? Yeah. Why, why, yeah. why are you not keen to give traction? What is so your... So first of uh, all, yeah, the couple of reasons for that, first of all, is the long hospital stay <laughs> and most of the times my, you know, the ward management may not be as good and they usually develop some kind of uh, you know, infections and uh, there's some issues especially keeping with the traction these young children i am not very uh, you know they don't keep the traction uh, i disagree with you there i yeah. think uh, traction is imperative in this situation okay okay sir and uh, and then of course monitor very closely yeah get by a, both i think yeah yeah get a lateral uh, x-ray to start with i also yeah. like to do a, a good CT scan of this and get a 3D model with which I can try to understand what exactly is happening. Okay. So anybody else? Samir was talking something. Yes, sir. I will also get a CT angio as sir mentioned in addition to the Okay, that, that's a good, good idea. Yes, sir. So what are the options? Uh, the conventional options have been transoral odontoidectomy with fixation and we have got anterior releases. And uh, we have got all this all posterior approach uh, where we put uh, C1, C2 distraction cage with uh, pedicle screw fixation. So anybody has any comments on either of these three options? Any Anybody has any other option for this? Yes, yes Neerat sir. <clears throat> you want to say something? Yeah, Neerat. Yes. Uh, he has his hand up. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I think you know I would agree. Agree, and you know maybe I've learned from Dr. Sajan sir that you know traction is probably a mandatory thing in my practice. You know to classify whether this is a reducible AAD or a irreducible AAD, because my surgical technique probably would depend on that. If it is a reducible AAD, then you know maybe I just simple the traction, reduce it. And maybe I would want to fix an, in an extension to uh, uh, align the odontoid with uh, 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 an, you know, a proper position. And if it is an irreducible bun, then probably you know, I would want to go for a C1, C2 distraction and ECR technique, which is uh, popularized by the Delhi group. So I guess you know, uh, traction is mandatory. And I think all posterior, very rarely in my experience, I've had to go anterior. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Neeraj, but I had uh, one bad experience with the traction. Since then, I have stopped using it. No, nothing personal like that. Okay. So, uh, this is what I did. I did the third option, all posterior approach and uh, uh, mobile. This is an interoperative video which shows mobilization of the C2 ganglion and there you are entering into the C1, C2 joint. That's on the right side and this is on the left side. So getting the venous plexus, you know, uh, properly coagulated and uh, getting a good hemostasis is very mandatory in such cases. And uh, this is how I do. I put a five millimeter chisel inside, just uh, put it in along the joint line, just open it up like this. Try to distract it slowly, slowly, not very fast. Just try to open it partially initially on the other side, wait for some time, again do it. And uh, this is the cage insertion. This is the position of the cage. And this is the interoperative photograph. On the left side, we have the cage which, which is being punched in the C1C2 joint. 
on the right side after that we followed with with pedicle screw fixation of the c1 and c2 and this is the reduction which we get after uh, you know uh, this uh, now in this particular case there was a significant assimilation of uh, c1 with the occiput and normally sometimes i do put uh, lateral mass uh, which are below the arch of the c1 not exactly you know but here the c1 was pretty much uh, hypoplastic so i didn't uh, dare to put the c1 lateral mass in this case I just extended it to the occiput and this was the reduction which i got and these are the pre operative and the post operative images and uh, that's the girl so anybody has any comments any suggestions no oh, excellent job pramod it was a very challenging case and uh, uh, this is what the technique dr goel uh, 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 is promoting promoting but uh, what i felt that the cage yeah. on the uh, right side is yeah. slightly medial yeah that was see the even though it looks medial in the ct it was actually put under uh, under visual guidance you know visual this, guidance yeah yeah so and it was we are actually the seeing the spinal cord con completely till the you know lower side because we yeah, have yeah so it was the, the ct ganglia and so she was quite far away from the body. yeah yeah but Hello? it's a very good uh, the basilar invagination is completely reduced you could reduce it very very well yeah. excellent uh, effort in a 13 year old girl absolutely beautiful so coming to the second case this was uh, uh, slightly uh, you know a uh, uh, kind of a surprise for me uh, again a very simple uh, looking ad not very complicated 15 year old boy again uh, myelopathy science but these looking at the c1 c2 dislocation the the kind of myelopathy science he had were much more as compared to what i was expecting and uh, so this is i did i did a ct angiogram not a, i could not manage a mr angio but this was the ct angio and i was not very happy with the position of the vertebrals on either side even the vertebral this is on the right side the vertebral on the right, right side was quite medial and the vertebral on the left side was actually open i could it's the first time i actually saw a vertebral you know between the c1 facet and the c2 facet it the, the because of the hypoplastic uh, facets of both the c1 and c2 on the left side i could actually see a pulsating uh, vertebral there and this is what it looked intraoperatively you can see this uh, big vein this is not the venous plexus which you normally see uh, uh, over the c2 ganglion which can be coagulated and you know uh you know shrunken and you can you know just retract it but this is actually an entire big vessel and which can see this on this side you know a ct mr angio in this case would have been better but i would no, i was not able to manage it because it was somebody else's case and uh, this is something which was worrisome and the c2 uh, the vertebral artery could be clearly seen on the left side in this region so again what are the options in such cases can we put c1 c2 screws c2 was not looking good it was completely anomalous medially placed and high riding vertebrals so for me any any suggestions in this case anybody has any opinion or some experience to share with hello if the c1 is assimilated like it is in this it's very yeah it was not only assimilated it was massive. very small yeah it was very and small and second is on the side where the vertebral is just going to cross into your uh, path i think it is going to be disastrous to even attempt it i think safely if there is no c1 uh, arch no c1 lateral mass then i think the only way to is just skip that level and try and go lower down yeah wo c3 fusion is okay e2 laminar screws also maybe yeah so so c1 screws uh, normally i normally put even though it is assimilated but not in this case and uh, because the vertebral so i'm i was not very comfortable with the vertebrals on either side and that's why i plan to extend it to the occiput now problem of c1 c2 reduction was not a big issue for me because it was uh, not a it was sort of a mild to moderate uh, 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 dislocation, not a 
and easily reducible. But the challenge was to hold the reduction and uh, C2 pedicle screws, which we uh, conventionally use, was not possible. I wouldn't dare to put a C2 pedicle screws. C2 power screws, sometimes if there is a high riding vertebral, I try to put uh, as close and as parallel to the facet. But uh, here, uh, because of the exposed vertebral artery on the left side, I, I didn't think of uh, that also. So C2 pass again was a risk uh, to because of the exposed uh, vertebral on the left side. And uh, normally I try to put these par screws parallel to the joint and uh, very high up. But uh, that also was, you know, that plan was abundant. And C2 trans laminar I felt was the safest in this case. Yeah. Although not a very strong hold as compared to the pedicle or the pass, but uh, we can always augment it with a C3 lateral mass. So this is what I did. And uh, here you can see the, the reduction is there. And again, if you see at the, um, uh, this is what I wanted to show, you know, uh, here you can see the, uh, the right-sided uh, laminar screws. You can see it is like entering into the vertebral artery foramen, but actually, you know, uh, this whole thing is, this is part of the lamina here. This is the vertebral, very anteriorly placed and this is where it is turned in. So the pedicle here of the C2 body was very narrow and what it looked like a vertebral here is not actually a vertebral. Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, this is kind of enlarged lamina or maybe part of the vertebral also, but I, uh, luckily I stopped short of uh, entering into that uh, foramen. And uh, These are the post-operative uh, CT scan pictures again. So the moral of the story I feel is uh, getting an angio CT or a MR angio, I think in every case is a must uh, because of such surprises which we normally get. And even if you, uh, if you consider the of ligating whatever that thing was on the, uh, this right side, sorry. So if you consider this as a venous plexus on top of the C2, C2 ganglion, then it would have been a big disaster. So identifying this preoperatively on the angiogram and identifying the vertebral also on the uh, left side was of primary importance. And it's, it's a good idea to change have, or have a backup plan interoperatively to get away uh, you know, uh, from difficult situations. This is what I felt. Uh, any comments? I think very nicely executed, Pramod. Uh, Dr. Pallav? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. This is a beautiful done case. And uh, as there was a uh, risk to the vertebral artery because of the uh, anatomical variations. So I think in such cases, translaminal screws are good. Uh, can I ask a question to Dr. Pramod? Yes, yes, please. Ah, but whatever like the structure is seen in the right hand side image, it still looks yeah. very much like a venous plexus, you know. And so it was actually, it looks like a venous plexus. There is definitely veins around, but huh. it was pulsating. Okay. Okay. Because it the was actually pulsating. Is, is very much like a venous plexus. So no, uh, uh, it, it was video. pulsating. This is a snapshot. Actually, I should have okay. taken a video of it. It was quite okay. pulsating. So I've never seen a vertebral so dorsally or you know so superficially placed um, as compared. Yeah, and you can yeah. see it on the yeah, you can see it on this side also, no? On the CT. Yeah. I think it must be an engulf within that plexus, maybe. Yeah, uh, the no, vertebral no, is no, inside and it is story. engulfed around with the you know venous plexus. Yeah. The moral of the story is that uh, what Pramod has done is, you know, and uh, planned is very, very good. It is, it, one should not go into this with, uh, with, with, without having all the investigations. And having uh, done them, then you know exactly what to find when you open. And you, you, you know you have to be cautious. And the other good thing is he had plan A, plan B, 
and that was again uh, a good uh, good good uh, way to go uh, i think uh, he has done a great job yeah thank you sir yeah perfect i think that was a concluding uh, remark from uh, our academic chair sajan sir and thank you pramod for this wonderful uh, cases uh, and we move on to the next uh, uh, interesting topic today and we have uh, the rafa nadal of spine surgery with us who who started playing way back two decades back and now also is winning the grand slams and is none, none other than dr abhay nene who will be talking about anything but spine is dr nene around i'm around I'm, i think my camera is shut so if you don't mind i'm restarting can you just hold some questions just 3 minutes i'll be back because i'm restarting my computer yeah yeah so we will uh... take some more questions for pramod because his talk was too good so uh, i'll yeah. just ask one question to pramod pramod sir so uh, have you has he considered any time stand alone cages for the c1c2 joint Doctor Lokande, can you hear us? I think is no, but uh, there there are uh, some 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 experiences of putting the bone graft, but not stand alone cages because now uh, the uh, one is that they are custom made uh, and the size is very very small, three to three point five, and uh, mm. uh, yeah, at times if you try to distract the joint, it is uh, it it looks like that joint is very small. You really need to. give traction open up the joint uh, i am i am not sure anyone has tried only stand alone distraction at c1c2 but uh, i think uh, anyone has any experience i so would I, not sir, recommend it yeah i think there are some papers for the anterior open reduction and uh, stand alone intra articular screw i think i mean but they are not actually cages but there are uh, uh, there are published reports of doing an anterior open reduction of the c1c2 joint to help reduce it and then like you would do it uh, like a magral screw from the posterior no, 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 but you do an anterior yeah. screw yeah see that out the partner is the uh, uh, can i pioneer for that yes sorry i was late uh, uh, i think stand alone c1c2 cages are a bit risky because that uh, you know area is uh, so mobile and so uh, you know uh, i think you have to augment it with either a plate either from the anterior side or screws from the posterior side i've done couple of cases or a few cases like what dr parker does you know anterior reduction with cage and anterior plating c1 c2 by the high retropharyngeal approach but I, what i what i felt with that is that the the ability to of the plate to hold the reduction intact even though the reduction is very easy to achieve and it uh, it's, it becomes a very easy surgery in the end but in the long run the ability to hold the uh, the plate which uh, to hold the reduction it it's not there there is some loss of reduction most of the times yeah. and i still feel that uh, the posterior fixation is uh, still because it catches a falling uh, man from the killing, uh, cliff from the back side it's like that so you wouldn't push it from the front i would like to pull it from the back so there was one more question in the question panel any role for the transoral uh, transoral odontoidectomy for the cases discussed i think that particular surgery is now almost becoming obsolete uh, unless uh, you know uh, uh, you know sajan sir what is your opinion oh i absolutely agree uh, more and more as we talk to our uh, aims uh, uh, upper cervical guys Uh, this aspect has been made very clear there is absolutely no role for transoral and i have seen some horrendous issues when i used to operate with a neurosurgeon and they used to then maybe 25 years back do a transoral the complications were un- unacceptable yeah i totally agree with that yeah. <clears throat> Can I can I start a discussion here till Doctor Nene is online? Yes, yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> so in the past couple of cases, we realized that vertebral artery was a big challenge in cervical fixations. Uh, so the question to the uh, you know to the Sanjeeti team because you now have navigation and OAM and uh, even Guru who's been using all these regularly uh, with the newer generation navigations and uh, you know intraoperative OAMs. How much really do you uh, do a preoperative CT and you study the vertebral artery? 
uh, is it still a part of your protocol or now do you just rely on the navigation and go ahead with cervical fixation? No, I think uh, I think it's a very good question, uh, Priyank, because uh, if you are actually seeing the pedicle, why you really need the NGO, that question arises. But as we, uh, whatever training we have seen, uh, we feel comfortable. We don't want any aberrant uh, vessel at that level. Therefore, it is imperative or it's mandatory to have a CT NGO or MR NGO. We prefer to do a MR NGO. You know the course, you know where it is bifurcating or it is uh, any aberrant course. That's very, very important. You know, what I fully agree. Is, I fully yeah. agree. Uh, without that, you should not undertake this surgery. And in fact, uh, your navigation or robot, they will only show the bones. Yeah. And if you have no idea where the vas vasculature is, you you can end up with even more serious problems yeah. uh, putting these screws without actually dissecting. You you can have you can have confidence of doing it, but you can't be overconfident by uh, you know not doing an appropriate investigation. Yep. Yes, Neeraj. So uh, in continuation to what you know you were saying that you know even navigation yes it does does give an anatomical description of pedicles. Uh, I have one. I had one experience where I was, you know, doing similar case what Dr. Gomot showed, and uh, I had an vertebral artery injury while putting the cage inside. So if you don't know, you know, which is the dominant artery, you know, I mean, dominant in circle of bilis, you know, your plan changes. It was a non-dominant artery, and you know, we could just coagulate and we can we could come out. If it is a dominant artery, you know, it is recommended that you must do a vascular repair as far as possible. So knowing preoperatively which is dominant and which is not dominant also makes a lot of difference in this kind of patient. So preoperative NGO is absolutely must, even in the era of navigation. Yeah, completely agree, uh, Neeraj. Um... So I, I would say uh, see, it is must whenever we are doing CV junction or maybe the Atlanta axial junction. But if you're if you're planning to do a subaxial pedicle screws, uh, if with navigation you can get away without doing uh, angio actually uh, sub axial because uh, you can injure the vertebrately not while putting the screws more while exposing whenever it comes to atlanto axial and uh, cv junction anomalies so you have to know where is the vertebral artery especially there there so you have to do angios but maybe in when you are planning to do a sub axial pedicle screws you can skip that step if you have a navigation yeah, perfect, perfect. Uh, and just to uh, talk about the debate today, uh, as we have seen, Dr. Neeraj Basawda gearing up and Dr. Gururaj, and both of them are in touch with me for last one week. They're messaging that I will prefer to go last. And, you know, I, I really was uh, puzzled. And finally, I said, you know, no, I will check with the uh, academic chair. And academic chair told us, we'll just go with the program. We'll not change the sequence, whatever pressure they are giving it from Delhi or Ahmedabad. And we are not changing the sequence guys and we have um, our evergreen uh, rafael nadal who is not retiring and he is the same for last two decades or more dr abhay nene uh, and and it will be unwise if i give introduction about abhay but for newer uh, generation and uh, guys who are just entering orthopedics and spine surgery abhay is a superstar spine surgeon from mumbai and um, he is practicing at various places uh, and mainly they have a group called as VR Spine. And uh, Abhay is an enthusiast and Abhay is into so many things from uh, childhood, we can say. And we know he's a lot of friends. He's into music, guitar, sports, mountaineering, cycling and so many activities. And we thought no other person will be an appropriate choice for this non-academic session. Then uh, Dr. Uh, Abhay Nene, alias Rafael Nadal, who is not retiring. And let's know what is the success, uh, secret of his success and fitness. Over to you, you, Dr. So Nene. You are about to retire me after all that introduction. And I'm very excited about all that fantastic academic discussion we had because it really keeps you at the edge of the seat. And I must say as a disclaimer that before I talk about my non-academic uh, talk or achievements because a part of the talk is slightly vain. It slightly talks about my own achievements. I must say that your, my first love and all of first love is still spine surgery. And if you if you are not a good spine surgeon, if you are not an insightful, skilled, dynamic, and famous spine surgeon, everything else falls flat. So you have to first become the world's best in what you like. And according to me, that's spine surgery. And everything else can be, you know, also ranks because then you get, uh, you know, 
uh, scaled in in that category. But uh, you know, I'm I'm loving the topic that I've been given. It's about life beyond orthopedics mm-hmm. and about fitness. So I'm going to jump into it straight away and make a very bold statement, saying that um, orthopedic spine surgeons are actually medical sportsmen. Okay, so we are not thinking doctors. We are touch feel doctors. A hand. Uh, hands, you know, coordination, eyes, senses, they are the ones that matters. And uh, some years ago, in the New York Times, there was a public, not a litigation, obviously, but an article that suggested that uh, why shouldn't our doctors go through a fitness test? Because just like you can't go to a cop who's unfit or you can't expect a military man to defend your country if he's got a big pot belly, how can you expect your surgeon who's unfit to be, you know, skilled in doing a surgery on you? And because surgeons are hand-skilled people and physical and mental fitness is important, just like F1 drivers or chess players or whoever else. And uh, this became quite a, you know, quite a controversy. And uh, this still remains uh, top of the heap in the discussion points when a patient comes to a surgeon. And um, what surgeon needs when you think of sportsmen and surgeons, uh, a surgeon needs long focused hours of surgery. And I've just put two pictures on the right that can compare, you know, the sportsman with the surgeon. He needs a steady head in tight spots, right? So when when things go wrong, you have to be absolutely cool and calm. And you need to be aggressive in a controlled manner. Because if you're just slow and, you know, calm and slow and calm, you know, most of your work can take all day, especially as a spine surgeon. So you have to be very quick when the, on the full toss, you've got to hit it out of the ground. I mean, that's, there, there's no question about that. So when you think about it, um, for us, there's no other option than the highest performance because a patient actually given his life into your hand and you've got to, you know, you have just one chance to do what is best. You don't have a second over, there's no second power play, right? So with that, you must remember that all sportsmen uh, spend a whole lot of time. So I'm giving you a few examples. Uh, uh, Virat Kohli has come to me as a patient and he spends three days of his week just in physical fitness without playing cricket. Um, Djokovic spends four days in a week just doing physical fitness, not tennis. Right? So, uh, they all understand the importance of being physically fit and um, physical fitness becomes a mandate before you can even talk about your skill sets in in the sports that you do and the surgery that we do. Right? So, it becomes a few of the modifiable factors which can enhance your surgical performance because some of it is gift, some of it is talent, but some of it is modifiable. And if you think about it, um, you know, this is the modifiable factor. Now, there's a second aspect to it that aside of this physical fitness and the brawn that we talk about, you also need, uh, you know, you need steady hands, of course, you need sharp eyes, but you need a calm head. And a calm head is something that a surgeon intuitively does not come to life with. You're never, a surgical personality is never born with a calm head. I mean, think of all the surgeons around you. They all are pretty aggressive and pretty agitated all the time. And that's what makes you a surgeon. Someone said that being an asshole is the part of the personality, right? But you know that, you know, the, you know, rubbish happens at the top of the panic button, right? So your senses are bet- most required when there's a surgical disaster. For example, I, I was doing a tail lift and the cage slipped, it broke a big artery and eventually landed up, as you can see, in the right pulmonary artery. Now, that's when, which was three hours into surgery, I really needed to have a calm head to manage this, right? So, surgeon needs to be prepared to lift his game at the zone of discomfort. It's okay to say that, look, I'm chilling here in my house and I'm giving you a nice chop, but it's really when there's the, you know, bamboo up the bottom is when you really have to pick your game up and be able to say that I'm now performing at my best. Now, keeping physically fit not only improves physical fitness, as you all would uh, imagine, it improves your the way you can hold your mind because it um, improves serotonin and endorphin uh, secretion, which makes your capacity to control your mind much more. And hence, it's almost like a practice game before you do surgery. And uh, in surgery, you're going to be in situations that are uh, outside your zone of comfort, your zone of control. If you can do or put yourself into these positions in a zone of control, in a controlled environment, in a situation where, you know, you can have, uh, you know, control over, uh, you can practice actually to be able to handle these situations which come to you otherwise as a surprise because it's a part and parcel of our package. It's just not okay to know the the variations of the vertebral artery if you're not able to have a good temperament when you're dealing with the problem actually. So you may, you know, know all the variations 
if you're not able to deal with it, uh, it's all null and void, right? So physical and mental fitness goes together. And um, I'm going to talk to you about all of us here. I, I think I, I'm including myself, even uh, Shah Rukh Khan, Shailu, and uh, the trekking Guru Raj and everyone else that um, we are 40, I'm 50. And uh, when you look down, you're not so happy to look at the belly at the bottom. And I'm going to talk to you about fitness at 40, which can translate to fitness at 50 or even 60 if you wish. But uh, it's a surgeon's guide to how to actually convert from a couch potato to being uh, physically fit, right? So we are all busy spine surgeons. And uh, you know, we all have enough excuses to not be fit because we are busy doing the work that we do. But now that we've established that a part of our professional expertise lies in being physically fit, we must know that we want to now convert ourselves. It's fair to say that from 35 to 40, sorry, from 25 to 40, I spent time establishing my surgical career. But now at 40, when you're on a, on a home run, as we say, and you, there's a you know, steady ascent in your career that's going to happen no matter what you do because of the 15 years that you put in behind. Um, it's a good time for you to now look at, uh, you know, zoom out and look at the big picture. And this is where you need to have an urgency in planning your fitness, right? So whenever you think of fitness, it has to be an inspired moment. You have to suddenly feel the click in your head and say, look, I want to start. And that start has to be like today, not even tomorrow. It has to be like today, right? And for that, you need to, uh, you know, realize that we spend all our lives, you know, in the zone of comfort. So you get up in the morning, your maid gives you chai, then the driver take, drives you to the hospital. When you walk in the, you know, the watchman salutes you, your residents are around you. And it's a zone of comfort. Everything is going in a happy place. Everything makes you feel good. But really, magic lies in the zone that's outside the zone of comfort. The zone, the zone of comfort can become very repetitive. It, can, it does not add anything new to your life. And if you want to do something that is new or you want to gain something that you've not had, you'll have to do something that is new, right? So the, how do you start? So if you're 40 and you're unfit and you say that I want to become fit, how do you start? So the simple rule is that you should set aside three to six weeks as the inertia period. And this time you just put your head down and follow a set plan. And that plan is uh, literally, you know, something very simple. And it's a simple, disciplined, repetitive activity, uh, as simple as walking three kilometers uh, in 30 minutes every day, right? So taking out 30 minutes and going for a walk is not a huge deal. So all you need to do is make sure that you're timing your walk and the walk is not happening randomly. So 30 minutes, three kilometers walk five days a week for three weeks or four weeks can set the tone. And once the tone is set, your body starts to discipline itself to uh, fitness. And at this point, I must say that we come, up, come back from our workplaces thinking that we're tired, but uh, like some of my slides in the future, in, in a little later, I'm going to say that this tiredness is a tiredness of boredom and the tiredness is cured by actually going for a walk or for a run or for you know, a game of badminton. Because the tiredness is not, not a physical tiredness as the word, of, as the word defines it, right? So walking is a great, great plan to start. You just follow a small doable goal and just repeat it so that you're able to at least pass the three or four week mark before you then think of other low impact activities like swimming. And at that point, because your watch tells you the time and distance, it also tells you the calories burnt. You start realizing the importance of calories in your life and you start becoming slightly frugal about what you eat and drink. Okay. Uh, it's um, uh, one of the tricks is to link the exercise to a habit you like. For example, I like music. Some people like share market. Some people like watching the news. So you can uh, do that while you're doing this activity. So it's not a wasted time. You're polluting two, two activities. So instead of sitting and watching the news or instead of sitting and watching a serial, you're walking and watching that serial or listening to a, to a podcast or anything else, right? So link it with something you like, link it to the person you like. You can actually talk to a colleague or a friend or a, you know, a cute girl who can uh, walk with you and, you know, give you that uh, pleasure of the company so that you again, you feel that you have, you know, spent time doing something constructive. It doesn't matter whether you, whether you walk in the morning or in the night, it doesn't matter where and how you walk. You can walk from in the treadmill in your house, you can walk in the garden and it really doesn't matter. Right. And um, make it bunk proof because, um, 
it's very easy to say that I'm too busy. I have no time. If you have time to eat and to dump, you have time to exercise. 30, 40 minutes in a day is not at all a lot. And one thing that works, which is, a, is my tip to you, is when you declare your intentions publicly. For example, last night, I uh, actually landed from Singapore. Okay, I la landed past midnight, but I already messaged all my friends that tomorrow I'm planning a 10K run. And um, there was no choice because the pressure on me was so much that I woke up and I did the 10K run because all my friends were about to ask me, did you run? How was the run? What timing did you do? Etc. So making your intentions public increases the pressure on an egoistic surgeon to deliver. So make that one of your tricks that uh, when you're making, you know, making the plan, say, uh, say it out to your closest buddies or your friends. And um, then slowly at week four or week six, you can add a sport. All of us have grown up playing some sport or the other. So you can use this newfound fitness that you found from walking and knocking off a few kilos into digging into old hobbies, whichever they are for you. And uh, then you can plan, uh, you know, making a partnership with the gym. So most of us have access to a gym. And a gym, unlike, um, you know, common myth, is actually a place which has been ergonomically designed to look after you. Right, So all the machines in the gym actually help you uh, do the exercise in the correct manner without injury. And you know, uh, people just say loosely that gym may injury, hota hai, bhagna, treadmill is bad, etc. Which is not true. It's actually been researched and designed to suit the human body. So uh, start working in the gym, ideally with a partner or with a friend who knows how to use the equipment because uh, this becomes your uh, rain-proof, weather-proof method, right? So wherever you are in the world, you're normally accessible to a gym and you can do workouts that can uh, work on specific muscles in your body. And uh, it's a mental block. But the minute, you know, you go with a friend and they teach you how to do, how to use different machines, it becomes easier and easier. And uh, once again, spend, uh, you know, a month or two before you think of notching up. Just spend an easy month in the gym and do all the basic stuff. Uh, those who don't have options of the gym have freehand options. And in the COVID time, most of us have learned lovely freehand exercises, which are called calisthenics because they, it uses your body weight to strengthen different muscle groups. Now, what are the common pitfalls when you think of, uh, you know, re resuming fitness in your life? One of the pitfalls that you say there's no time, but think about it. The day has 24 hours. Your work probably is 12 or 13 hours. You sleep probably six or seven hours. You still have you know, a good five or six hours, which you tend to waste. If you can make a workout, a, you know, important routine of your day, then you will easily be able to fit it in. It's impossible that you don't have time to do gym or to do workouts. Mm. The other, what I was saying is tiredness. And when we say we are tired, we are actually talking of three types of tiredness as listed on this slide. And the commonest tiredness is the tiredness of repetition of boredom, which is what we have in our daily life. We call it you know, mental fatigue and the treatment of that is not resting. The treatment of that is changing your mindset, you know, doing something that's different. The physical tiredness, which is where you're straining your muscles in the OR or, you know, running or whatever else you do, the antidote to that is muscle rest and nutrition. And emotional tiredness forms a very small part of our life, which actually responds to sleep. So uh, I'm just taking my head out and saying that sleep is not so critical to your life. And again, uh, just to walk the talk, I slept three hours last night and did a 54 minute, 10 kilometer run this morning. Okay. So it's uh, your capacity is well. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, uh, you know, that sleeping is not needed. All I'm saying is that your physical capacity is much more than you think it is. Uh, the other are dropouts and um, you try to avoid your daily tasks. So uh, it's a good idea to think of the activity beforehand. So if I were 30 patient clinic, by the time on my, I'm on my 15th patient, I'm already thinking, that, okay, five o'clock, I'm looking at a finish. What's going to be my immediate activity? And I have a bag that's packed in my car. So instantly, I have decided I'm going to do 5K of rowing or, you know, 25K of cycling or whatever else after my clinic. And that makes me kind of, you know, build it up. It's almost like, um, you know, visualization before you actually do it. And that helps. And um, underperformance is a problem. Sometimes, you know, at the end of 10K, you say that, I mean, you planned a 10K, but at the end of 7K, you say, I'm done. But your surgeon's ego should, uh, you know, should help you. Um, at this point, optimizing body weight, having a GPS watch, heart monitor, and having some good nutritional advice is good. 
and uh, then you can up the ante and this is where the part where you can use your fitness to do stuff like simple marathons chota marathons 10k 5k is there all over the place and for me my first marathon took me 2 hours and 34 minutes but my last marathon took me 1 hour and 56 minutes so you know it's you and you're challenging yourself um i love this uh, part that i can do 10 or 15k running anywhere i've run on the great wall of china everywhere i run i've run in lay everywhere i go for a meeting or for some other reason i make sure i run and i see the city in the way i like and all my runs have been most of my abroad runs have been linked to conferences and spine meetings so um now here's another part when if you're 40 successful and unfit and you feel you're too fat to run uh you could think about cycling because cycling is the next big thing that's happening to middle aged men who are uh, you know not fit and it's a low impact activity which does not which is a great cardio it pushes your heart to the limit but without any impact so when you do a 50 60 k ride you still have the whole day without feeling the brunt but when you do a 7 8 k run you feel the brunt and you can use cycling to explore the world in a way that nobody has explored and you can see routes and see uh, regions of the world so the tour of the nilgiris in india's largest is longest tour and uh, most of us i think shailu also has signed up for it is a 1000 km ride that happens and we've all signed up for it again i i finished i was one of the few finishers with dr anand joshi in um, 2014 and um, i remember going up the kalahatti when you're cycling up uti and there are 36 hairpin bends and one of them says that we can give you a free mortuary van so it's really you know it pushes your mind to the limit and you know you can easily break down but if you can scale that wall then you're probably uh, you know ready to face a vertebral artery or a, you know an anomalous structure in the, or some crazy bleeding that can happen during your surgery because you've upped your game remember i told you right at the beginning you've done this in a simulated manner outside of your ot and you know playing with your own lives and not with the life of your patient and um, uh, you know proudly we finished uh, of the 35 finishers of the 130 applicants you know two of us were orthopedic surgeons and one was a radiologist so it was a great feeling and we used that uh, fitness to move to the manali lay cycle ride which as you can imagine was you know really really hard and it felt like you're cycling on the surface of the moon literally because uh, but you get to see the world in a different way you get to see the world in a way that nobody has seen we did a uh, delhi bombay fundraiser which made us very very popular with some of the paparazzi and uh, we also did the um, you know cycle around iceland ride in, in three days in the summer solstice so typically we are able to um, take our fitness to help us live a life in a 360 degree manner so we formed this group called the ninja turtles and shailu is a part of this group and i'm imploring sajan to join us cuz it's a group of fit swine surgeons who want to use their fitness and enjoy life and we um, every year we actually take up a you know a few hundred kilometer ride in europe and we are able you can see familiar faces here uh, you know some of the big bosses of spine surgery and um, uh, we we've been able to see some parts of the world that no one has seen in a way that no one has seen because you're like riding you're on two wheels and you you're looking at the whole world in a 360 degree manner and some of the tricks is equipment you spend on bikes spend on watches and um, you know once you're fit the third part of your fitness is actually exploring the world on the mountains and um, you know i would also advise you strongly to use your fitness to actually go up and do start start climbing mountains because the best views are at the top and once you're able to climb the you know once you're able to defeat the fear of heights and once you're able to you know conquer a mountain your uh, you know entire persona changes and you become a fearless um, uh, you know fearless guy and you're able to do you know lots of things that uh, in surgery that you would have never imagined because it's ultimately the mind so why should you do it it's not just keda it is uh, really because of the reasons i told you right at the beginning um life has to be experienced and it should not be lived on the internet which is a bad disease that's affecting us and you should be able to live free and sometimes because you're fit you get to see the fittest people around you so uh, you know one of my claim to fame at a younger age uh, was that because i was running cycling mountaineering all these superstars uh believed in me and they came to me and you know it it gave you it gave you that little bit of page 3 you know limelight because you get to see them because they know they that you think like them and you know you're not going to say are dard ho raha hai to dodo mat it's never that right because you yourself run you can make it a family package so it's always good to involve your spouse so she is the support system and you can you know give small doses to the spouse but if she runs with you or she cycles with you then life comes in full circle and you know every everyone is happy 
So that's again a tip that I would give you. And finally, I want to tell you that there are two halves of your brain. There's a right half and a left half. Don't miss working on the right lobe of your brain and develop soft skills. All of you have them, but music, reading, painting, whatever you like, but develop soft skills that can balance this hard skill that you develop as a surgeon. And uh, because you don't live once, you actually die only once. You live every day. So make that life, you know, totally worth living and make it, uh, you know, at the end of your life, you should feel that, you you know, it's a life that has been well, well led. You were never, uh, you know, you were never born into this world to be a spine surgeon. You're just making that, a, you know, making that a rule in your head. You were born to live a life. And at the end of your, you know, at 70, if you say that I've done some great spine surgery, but uske baad kuch bhi nahi kiya, I think you'll be unhappy. So uh, it's now that you need to realize all of you, because I can see all of you, whoever is here, you're all at the, at a good plinth in your career. And this is the time to make the change, pull back a bit and live your life in a far more horizontal manner rather than just vertically diving down the slope of spine surgery. So that's my game and I'm available for uh, questions, you know, in the future. I know I've overrun time, so maybe we don't have time to take questions now. But uh, please do shoot out to me because I'm more than eager to help people. Thank you. Amazing and inspiring. Himanshu, thank you. And uh, I know all of you, Shailesh, I know you cycle, you run and, uh, you know, Priyang does uh, diving and everyone does something or the other. But all I'm saying is that keep investing. Like, don't be, don't be happy. Just be unhappy that I want to do more and more and more. And spine surgery will keep happening by the side. Because you've all reached the stage where patients will come to you. Sir, uh, do you practice a fixed daily routine in such type of thing? Do you, yeah, something uh, or you the advise other is to... the daily routine. Something or the other is the daily routine. Like I said, you know, three days in Singapore, I had not done anything. I was just drinking and partying. So, and today... I just came in, I had to, so four days a week. So I'm going to say that you do two hard cardio days every week, two hard muscle building days every week and two sporty days every week, whatever you like. And then if you have a target, like now we have a cycling target in December, you would uh, tweak that, uh, tweak that uh, routine. Yeah, Dr. Green, Green, you have, uh, yeah, you have a busy practice and uh, we just want to know which time suits your practice. Like what is a uh, good time where you really want to, Focus. So, you know, I understand time. this whole pressure about practice and about, you know, but um, I don't think any of us can practice in a skilled manner for more than 10 hours a day. Like if you're working 10, 12 hours a day, you're maxed out and then you're not going to be performing well. So if you can decide which 10 hours those, those are going to be or 12 hours, those are going to be, you can have at the beginning or the end of the, of the day. So invariably my weekends are morning times and my weekdays are evening times to do workouts. Okay. Uh, can I ask and, great uh, talk, Dr. Abhay? Can I ask a question? Of course you can. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So they say that uh, the exercise should be done with a pleasant mind and a body, you know, which is conducive for doing it. So after working for 10, 12 hours a day, when your body is already stressed out, giving more stress with an exercise is advisable or you feel it is so, like... Know, Ajay, it, what you said is an excuse that people give to not exercise. And uh, the stress that we talk about, right? When you come out of your, say you've had a discectomy or a laminectomy or a listhesis case in the morning and you've seen, uh, you know, 30 really irritating patients through the day. So that stress has to be locked up and put there because it does not help you uh, have a good life in the, you know, from 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whenever you go back home. And that has to be your time. And it's your time to actually develop, to be able to handle the stress next day. And if you mm. just go home with that same stress, you know, thinking at night, Are, uska wo numbness kyun ho ra tha and isko yaar post-op pain ho ra hai, uska relative thoda unhappy hai, it's not going to help you because it's not, you know, if you're having dinner and thinking of those thoughts, it's not going to help you. And you're going to go back the next day totally weak and, you know, not ready. But if you've done something kick-ass, you come out so confident. There's something called endorphins and you feel invincible if you've done a workout. So actually, That's I'm saying that as a therapy, to this so any good time? Is it early in the morning or late in the evening? That's exactly what I said. That it could be either ends of the day. It's difficult to do it in the middle of the day. But don't shy away. So typically I end my day now, you know, post-COVID, I end my day by 6 or 7. And uh, you have that 8 to 10 p.m. slot to do anything you like. So even one hour in that slot is okay. And on week weekdays, you don't want to waste the mornings because it's lovely out there in the morning, you know, wherever you are. So You think you're you teaming think up or having a group is important? A group helps a lot because there's peer pressure. 
like i said once i announce or if once someone from the group puts up so i did a you know 800 calorie workout i'm like always under that fomo pressure so group always helps but i must say that most of the sports that as a 40 year old you, you would practice are individual sports so don't worry if there's no group you just compete against yourself and a group will form around you so just because there's no group don't say that i don't want to work out running so, cycling gymming is all individual sports so dr abhay yeah. i have i have one question you know uh, i am a evening person so i always have one question that what about post dinner so um, i think um, you know for uh, neeraj because when i was a resident i would not finish before 10 or 10 not resident just post <laughs> and i made a habit of doing runs from 10:30 to 11:30 at night literally at night i would be running on the road and then i would do dinners after that so you know i would say do the workout after the i mean before the dinner and push the dinner to late and then you know go off to sleep i know it's not that healthy from a weight perspective because if you're sleeping on a full stomach it's a problem but um, you know practically speaking 10:30 to 11:30 or 10 to 11 if you do a workout you can still eat at 11:30 and sleep at 12:30 and still be up in the ot by 8 o'clock in the morning right abhay sir i have one question yes sir so uh, uh, like you do training on the day when you have to operate a surgery in the morning slot so do you feel that you know you don't have the exact fine control if you have uh, no, I had been joined in by yeah so again i'm going to say i'm going to come in because i've done that over and over and there are these you know hard surgeries that are planned like you know some difficult scolies or sometimes you know upper cervical and um, i just need fine control i can just say that you don't want to do heavy weights on the morning of your big operation because your hand skills can get compromised if you don't heavy weights and your proximal muscles are fatigued then you can have a problem but you can do cardio beautifully and uh, you can try that the next time harpreet when you have a mediocre surgery which you which is not so challenging because you don't have experimental challenge but the endorphins that get released give you so much confidence when you go into surgery that you're like beautiful and uh, your physical capacity as a you know 30 or 40 year old as you are is far more than what your mind uh, you know tells you and you try it and you will know that boss i didn't know i could do this and you can just do it so um, try it and you will believe what no, sir, you you are inspiring sir for last one or two years trying to change a little bit of routine yeah they um, like go for a 5k run and do your scoli surgery you will be more than happy to do it you will love doing it a great great talk inspiring and spectacular is the only word i can say yes, sir, uh, about and me. i would like to have a final word from another fit man from the group and he is the academic chair with us dr sajan sir to say up so he is the market leader i mean he is the one who's inspired all of us absolutely he looks today as he looked you know 30 years ago he does surgery with the same elan and same confidence and same skill sets as he did so many years ago so dr sajan i i mean we bow down to you sir thank you abhay comments yeah but uh, uh, i admire uh, i don't think uh, all of us can follow uh, by his foot, footsteps uh, he is pushed it to an extreme level but for most of us i think going to the gym keeping fit eating uh, sensibly and of course doing everything in moderation is the key thank you thank you sir for uh, kind words and uh, thank you dr nene for amazing show and uh, it's inspiring for all of us i'm sure uh, and we will keep interacting uh, we move on to the hot debate of the day and uh, we have uh, amdavad uh, versus delhi uh, neeraj wasavda versus dr gururaj and disc replacement versus fusion why i do it why i prefer it and over to you dr neeraj to uh, start the debate okay so i'll share my screen see there is even at a national level there is a debate between gujarat and delhi you know <laughs> so that is the reason we thought of uh... yeah so, so amdabad tries to invade delhi and delhi tries to invade amdabad you know that is the tradition anyway so uh, i thank uh, our academic chair dr sajan hegde and sideshan and tash and chiti team for Uh, giving me this opportunity to be a part of this hot debate uh, so we de- we do see this kind of a patient in our day to day life you know a female of 37 young male female comes with neck pain with left perpendicular pain normal neurology 
and we always have a two options to us whether we want to do an instrumented fusion or we are going for a replacement uh, i'm going to talk on the option cdr why i would choose a cervical disc replacement or artificial disc replacement i would want to divide my talk into uh, three categories one what the logic says why there is a debate and what does the evidence say now so logic of this kind of surgery always says we need to ask ourselves what is our goal of surgery so goal of surgery is neural decompression to an extent restoration of height and provide a stability so that these goals are persistent for a very long period fusion has just been a means to achieve this and maintain goal for long term fusion is never the primary goal of surgery in this kind of a patient can same be achieved while preserving a near natural motion and the answer is cdr or artificial disc replacement so logically cdr is always scores much higher than the acdf now why there is a debate there is a debate because we have option we have to choose between cdr or acdf and there is a need to find a better option why there is a need to find a better option because there is something dissatisfactory with current gold standard that is acdf so what are the disadvantage of acdf we are looking at we know that level above and below degenerates over a period of time and schwab in 2006 said that loss of motion at the fused segment is compensated by increase in flexion extension movement rotation at lateral bending movement at adjacent levels if you look at the historical papers delibrand way back in 1999 says that around 26% of your cervical fusion patient that is one in four patient requires second surgery within first 10 years of surgery so that is little scary and that's why we need to look at the option that how we can avoid this uh, uh, complications or disadvantages of acdm so what does the evidence say we have plethora as an internet and you know the journals are flooded with multiple data about cdr comparing with acdf i would want to stick to level 1 studies when we talk about artificial disc replacement we have two year, two years id data we have five year id data seven year and now we even have a 10 years data with 2021 mobi c disc uh, uh, data of 10 years i would want to divide this level 1 studies outcome into different five categories we'll start with the clinical outcomes we will look at the longevity results we will look at the reoperation rates of this devices we will look at the adjacent segment degeneration and what does the level 2 level disc replacement study says us fd has yet approved only up to two level so we will we are going to stick up to two level level 1 study so if we look at the clinical outcome most of this ide study says that outcomes are consistent across all the studies ndi was and patient satisfaction tdr is considered non inferior to acdr so tdr equals acdr some studies does show some major like pain and early return and all those stuff with tdr but you know that we will disregard all these studies has reported always a lower reoperation rate with tdr patients when we compare few of the meta analysis right from women any bartal by kp and upadhyaya and most of this meta analysis says that there is no significant difference in ndi sf36 or even doctor it can be a doctor or even the adverse adverse effect i guess there is all shailesh you have to mute yeah i did that i did it neeraj continue yeah neeraj neeraj you are muted so if you want to be like that it's okay because i can win the debate you are muted neeraj neeraj you are muted because yeah there are some disturbance neeraj unmute karo I think he. उसको समझ में नहीं आ रहा है कैसे करना है. I think uh, Shailesh has to unmute uh, Neeraj. हाँ Shailesh. Yeah, I am doing it. No, but then he can only ask to mute himself. No, so... I have cancelled. I have in, uh, unmuted everyone. No, but then still Shailesh, he has to unmute himself. You cannot unmute. You only can ask him to request no, him. I have unmuted him already. Ah, okay, yeah. sir. So can you can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. okay so i'll go with this uh, the present slide so uh, when we compare all this meta analysis of level 1 studies that says that no significant difference between almost all clinical results even the adverse effects are comparable with tdr and acdf even the grade 3 grade 4 adverse effects were comparable between this two group 
what is interesting is tdr has significantly greater neurological success rate and significant lower reoperation rate when compared to it was when it was compared to acdf if you look at the longevity studies 5 years and longer follow up has not demonstrated any worsening of improvement what we achieved by the end of 6 month and it has maintained up to 7 to 10 years in all this study reoperation rate many studies have shown that acdf is almost double or in some studies even triple the case of revision surgeries in first 10 years as compared to adr the recent publication of 10 year follow up of mobc has shown significantly almost 16 to 18% more chances of having revision than the mobc or 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 the cervical disc arthroplasty studies when we look at the adjacent segment degeneration many studies including harkovich says that 39% of patient with acdf will have radiological ald that is almost 50% and as we know that hillebrand says 2.9% per year of symptomatic ald over 10 years so every year your symptomatic ald increases by 2.9 or almost 3% and as we know that 6 26% almost require a revision surgery in first 10 years when you compare your ald or uh, the adjacent level degeneration with cervical disc arthroplasty cervical disc arthroplasty has significantly lower rate of adjacent level uh, segment de- de- degeneration both at superior as well as the inferior level and when we compare the two level studies much much bigger difference was noted between fusion and arthroplasty at all time points in almost all clinical parameters and allows a conclusion to say that two level cervical disc replacement is actually superior to our to fusion in most of these studies now there is an argument that this eventually doesn't move at long term so when we com- when we look at this study they said almost 72 or 3 out of 4 patient are mobile at the end of 5 years and that mobility is maintained over a period of time only around 15% or 16.4% fusion uh, implanted level were fused so if you look at this le- this graph one level two level above and two level below all the motions were preserved up to 10 years which is the latest data we we have in 2021 both in flexion and extension as well as into lateral bending then the argument comes up about heterotrophic ossification yes heterotrophic ossification reduces the movement but all grade 0 2 3 4 regardless of grading of heterotrophic ossification if you look at this graph the movement is preserved beyond the 5 years so initially yes it may have and some impact on motion but motion is preserved over a period of time then the question comes is cost effectiveness we do not have indian data but when we compare the united states data it is concluded irrefutably that around ctdr that is cervical total disc replacement is costing 1687 more than acdf over 5 years so initially yes it is expensive but over a period of 10 years when you look at the work productivity uh, early return to work and incremental cost effective ratio acdf and tdr the tdr is much comparatively cheaper than the ac acdf so to conclude at 5 7 and 10 years follow up of large patient cohort statistically significantly less radiological adjacent segment degeneration with disc replacement strong trend that motion is protective against any progress in asd cervical adr is even more efficacious in patient with two level disease reoperation rates are significantly less with artificial disc replacement and there is yet not data which suggests adr is inferior to acdf based on clinical outcome so my choice would always be cd uh, cervical disc replacement for one level always for double level we do not have very strong level one evidence to support more levels but you know european countries european fda has approved even for more but we will restrict ourselves to one or two level where we can say that cervical disc arthroplasty scores much over the acdf thank you so much thank you neeraj for a wonderful presentation thoughtful research oriented and backed with evidence we'll uh, ask gururaj to uh, uh, play the shots and then we will have a uh, few question answers over to you gururaj can you see my screen yes uh okay uh, so i knew um, first of all i would like to thank um, shailesh and his team for giving me this opportunity and uh, shailesh the virus 
of three idiots is trying to pitch us against the friends neeraj and myself against on this debate um but then uh, we all know that the acdf has been a gold standard treatment for any anterior cervical pathologies and it has been a time tested procedure yes neeraj said why we, why do we want to basically um, do adr he tries to took us on a joy ride over the course of his uh, ppt he tried to dodge out through all these obstacles but then i am sure if we follow up these patients for long term we are going to end up having something like this so he didn't actually tell us how not to get into accident so the argument i knew he is going to base upon all the literature evidence what is available and we know that if i go today on pubmed and try to search acdf versus adr most of it favors neeraj but then we have to see this very carefully and we all know that if you want to search for a literature literature is available for everything you want to say something which is good you have a literature for that so this bias we have to very very microscopically analyze all the studies which neeraj quoted and you see these 2017 2020 publications that there is a bias in the literature available today about cervical disc replacement this is again 2020 uh, review article on the bias on uh, cervical disc replacement so he started with the outcome studies yes all the meta analysis and review or systematic analysis dr neeraj quoted he are like this rabbit and tortoise race they all start well but then right now the literature available for the cervical disc replacement is like a rabbit they are all in their fun zone and they think they have one and they are sleeping but i am sure when we have a long term results we are going to be like tortoises so we will win with the acdf acdf will score better why so all the publications which are available to till today what they say conveniently dr neeraj didn't actually tell us what was those two three lines of end of conclusions so they all publications say right now there is a very low evidence on long term safety of outcomes of cervical disc replacement and they all advocate or if you read these conclusions of all these papers they say future long term multi centric randomized control studies are needed to validate the safety and efficacy of cervical disc replacement so definitely literature says there is some advantage but definitely cervical disc replacement doesn't outscore the time tested gold standard procedure that is anterior cervical discectomy and fusion so this he tried to quote this uh, outcome studies if you see this this just one of the examples at 84 months that is the seven year uh, pro disc study in terms of next disability index there is a very very negligible difference between cervical disc replacement and acdf so it's not a very significant difference and if you see the cost involved when i come to that so you will see that in conditions like in a, in a country like india definitely acdf will score more points over uh, adr so he already pointed it out why this replacement existed because of these few things that is adjacent segment degeneration adjacent segment disease and so called retaining motion at the level where we do a cervical disc replacement so i am not going to go deeply into the uh, basically these studies because already i said there is some bias in these studies but if you see definitely there is in favor that with the acdf there is a increase adjacent segment degeneration but whether this degeneration is accelerated or whether this degeneration is a natural process or whether this actually adjacent segment degeneration equals to adjacent segment disease and actually actually leads on to increased uh, uh, symptomatic levels that is again still controversial and if you see this paper it clearly says that only 20 per 21% of the replaced or indexed levels maintained 
a near normal motion at the disc replace segment yes there is a motion but then it is a compromised one if you see this paper again if you see none of the artificial disc retain normal rom or center of rotation especially in extension so presently mm -hmm. available disc replacement processes are nowhere near to the natural disc which is existing so again we all hear about adjacent segment degeneration facet joint force the force on the disc if you see this definitely yes at the acdf at the index level the facet joint force is less because you are fusing it but the adjacent segment force increases but at the adr the index level is increased in extension and adjacent segment is decreased so when you do uh, basically a uh, disc replacement there is a increased uh, force on the index level if it is decreasing at the adjacent level so again re operation rates i agree there is definitely reported increased re operation rates with acdf but we all know when we do surgery at a adjacent level or when we do surgery at a already operated level the complication rates are high when we do surgeries at a already operated level so this is a article from dr daniel ru in 2021 if you see these patients require more complex surgeries most of them can get away with only by doing acdf but some of them they require more complex surgeries or more frequent surgeries when we do a failed uh, cdr surgery so coming to neeraj he lives in amdavad he has big wigs his clients are big they can spend a lot he can choose to do adr but it is not the same scenario with india we we are in a different scenario india is a very cost sensitive market indian patients don't have huge amount of money to spend on a expensive fusion device that is cervical disc replacement adr is five times more costlier than acdf and you have to see again uh, he quoted some articles i can also count some articles like 2018 they said that they are both equally cost effective at the 5 years period but then he said after 5 years it is more cost effective but i would say if you read this paper carefully it needs to be active and mobilizing at that level for 14 years before it becomes cost effective so in terms of cost also if your disc is mobile till 14 years then only it is cost effective as compared to acdf so in that 14 years whether with the replaced disc level also whether the adjacent segment disc remains uh, without any having any adjacent segment degeneration uh, that is yet to be seen because we don't have studies of those 14 years period and then he said heterotopic ossification is not very common and with the grade 1 to 4 they are still mobile if you see this picture here if you can see that it's completely fused there so that the heterotopic ossification can be really really bad sometimes it completely fuses there can't be any movement at this disc level so other neglected factor or it might be a rare but then we have to give importance to this also the wear and corrosion of the metal alloys used in all the disc replacements so they can be potentially toxic and these metallic components can cause basically tissue reactions and osteolysis so in nutshell acdf is a gold standard it's a time tested procedure we have a long time results available we have all done it and we are still doing it if it would have had so many drawbacks we wouldn't have been doing it and it's a cheaper option especially suits to our conditions it definitely it shows some good results in short term there is a literature bias requires more long term studies to prove its efficacy it's expensive there is a high degree of learning curve we all know that whenever we want to preserve a motion we need to be very meticulous and the last i put it as a indication because the indications are very very limited or the kind of patients we see in our opds the very few patients are really can actually a suited amdavad thank you
Any quick comments? Yeah, I would like to ask Gurraj sir. Suppose you get a patient who is well affordable and he is having single disc all indications which fit into ADR. Then uh, you would do disc replacement or you will still go for fusion. So this, I think, uh, if you ask me over a coffee, then I can answer better. Not in this debate. <laughs> <laughs> so that that replies that you know that yeah. was my point. So I guess I I know I, I need to. Get oh, so I will I will twist the question for no, no, I, Viraj, Viraj, yes, I, yes, Viraj. I need I need no, to no, get, I will, you know, no. like UN Security Council. I have a right to reply. <laughs> so, yeah. I to, so I guess you know what what he claimed. You know most of the studies which he quoted there are open access journals. So I will not believe what he said. Second, okay. you know, my, my talk was only level one ID studies, which I have said. So bias as such, as such has been factored out. Third, uh, the TDR people, they never claim that what we are doing is uh, we are trying to give a natural disc. The disc indication, what they are saying is, you know, it prevents adjacent segment and probably is better in providing uh, less revision, revision surgery. Four, you know, being expensive or, you know, I mean, be, be living in a poor country, that does not justify that we don't offer a good option, which is there in a, a, as compared to ACDF. Yeah, that patient would choose that, you know, this is better, this is not better, this is costly, this is not costly. But I would definitely offer CDR to my patient. Indications of ACDF, you know, degenerative disc is more or less same as you, what you say except you know in a very degenerated segment for single double level i think you know indications are same in both technically also it is not demanding so you know being a poor surgeon is also not an excuse of not offering cdr <laughs> Viraj, Viraj, quick comment Viraj. so i would like to ask uh, both of you uh, so what are uh, guru's indication for adr and neera's indication for uh, acdf uh, can i can i quickly step in i wanted to make a comment yes yes sir Okay, so I have to tell you this incident of a patient who is coming to me next week from this country called Mauritius. She has undergone a disc replacement. She has severe pain, uh, arm pain, which has been bothering her ever since she underwent the surgery about three to four weeks earlier. She is desperate. She is coming here for a revision surgery. Now I want to ask Neeraj, or uh, Guru Raj, whether I should do a disc, uh, I mean, do a fusion or put another disc. Uh, having said that, I want to make the point that I was one of the first proponents because I love to restore motion. I was the first to start with the Brian, but I r realized that the Brian, which needed a lot of chiseling of bone, most of them fused at two years or three years. So they were excellent fusion devices. I still do disc replacement. I select the patients. Uh, uh, as Guru Raj said, perhaps you have to look at their purse before you offer the disc replacement option. I do very selectively. I do feel both the options are excellent. And it is like a lawyer, uh, experienced lawyer who's told to wake, wake up one day and talk on one side and he is able to produce the data for that side and the next day he is told to produce data for the next one and he is able to do that. So one can uh, one can get a murderer away uh, by with a good lawyer. So And third and last thing, this American data, uh, over the years, I have had great disbelief. No data from America or from North American, it, it is, I know I'm making a controversial comment, but it is all device and company. Uh, and one has to be very careful. Uh, so at the end, I think one should decide what is best for the patient and one can offer either one of them, but one has to do it properly. I, I completely agree with Sajan sir. I mean, I have used uh, Discover, DiscoServe, Prestige, Unic, all peak on peak. You know, I work with uh, Thai Prism, inventor of Maverick. We used to do every week two, three disc replacements. But uh, eventually, it's reduced uh, in number. The indications are very specific for both. And still, there is an indication for a disc replacement as well as Fusion is, as we all talk about, it's a gold standard. So for the younger colleagues, this is not a debate that uh, it's not Guru Raj versus Neeraj. It's a 
it's what i prefer and what i do and there is no clear cut winner because indications are most important and first important thing is that we should know how we deal with the situation how good surgery we can do the nerve root clearance the discectomy and in the olden days what sajan sir was talking in the brian's uh, days there used to be a lot of milling drilling we used to do and then we used to have rail track to put the device but now uh, the disc uh, replacement devices are also very very user friendly uh, so i think uh, we will not um, uh, take more questions because in view of time because this uh, debate is endless i really thank dr neeraj pasawda for a wonderful presentation as well as dr gururaj for equally competent and similar answer so both are winners and thank you guys for giving us a great show today thank you thank sir, you sajan sir concluded it very well absolutely thank you thank you thank you uh, and we move on with uh, uh, the next agenda as we are in the last uh, lag of the uh, spine weekend we have dr pramod uh, bilare will be talking about uh, quickly about how we deal with the patient in spine opd then we we, we will be having himanshu kulkarni uh, who will be speaking about Uh, practice at periphery how challenging things are and then we will have siddharth uh, ayer uh, who will be speaking about challenges in spinal infection over to you pramod hi uh, <clears throat> thank you sir i think it's a great session till now i'll just wrap it up faster so this is an approach where uh, i think all the masters here are approaching their spine patient in their opds uh the patient expectations when they visit your opd they require consistency they require privacy they want the patient the doctor to guide them properly in a phased manner so lot have lot of things have changed from the older opds to the new gadgetary opds we have nowadays but the process the overall diagnostic process has remained the same right from engaging the patients to communicate to having a circle of uh data collection to having a working diagnosis going to the communicating the diagnosis to, to the patient uh giving them the treatment and uh, finding out the outcomes the entire process has remained the same now here uh, for all our patients we are the sherlock homes they want to know what really is wrong with them they they present with uh, different uh, varieties of symptoms and they want the diagnosis as well as the treatment part so here i am not actually discussing the approach to every case but these masters these all these masters have a common language to speak so when they are finding a patient in their opd how do they approach so um, here we have uh, our own sherlock homes i think the initial match dr shailesh adgaukar and the sherlock homes my name is sherlock homes it is my business to know what other people don't know so they are actually uh, your patients they are your clients where they want to know what is wrong in their system so when uh, the, it starts at the start when they are engaging with yourself they are engaging into the process so very important is to keep their privacy influence them by your behavior see how uh, customizing and modularizing their treatment plan or the diagnostic plan and delivering them in a very phase manner which is very important at times we see that in a young generation nowadays that the patient engages in the initial 5 to 10 minutes and then they uh, sort out second or third opinion just because they were not able to engage in the initial process which was very very important then comes the very important part the main circle the diagnostic circle or the diet where you get all the necessary data from the patient have and formulate a working diagnosis and then move on so it starts with a simple history taking you might ask the patient what are the different symptoms the patient is presenting with how when how long and how it is progressing uh, right from the pain the deformity the neurological deficit he is having uh, at times we we uh, see the patient superficially but uh, our own sherlock homes will not see them superficially they will not only see but they will observe keenly not only the history but all the inspectory findings right from the patient having list of scoliosis they don't give any small weightage to uh, i mean the, they don't give any uh, negative any points of the patient they a great mind is something which uh, nothing is little for them every small points are picked up right from the history taking to the clinical examination inspecting from the front inspect inspecting from the sides inspecting from the back all this goes into the processing so it goes goes into the processes of 
not only the details of the list, this is details of the list, also uh, certain uh, clues like lipomas or the tuff of hairs, a fawn beard, a port wine stain, cafe lay spots, there are multiple nodular swellings like a neurofibromatosis. Everything starts getting into their heads to formulate a diagnosis. Also, certainly they do the movement examination from flexing to extension to side flexion to rotation at all the three levels, more so at the concern or the index level. Also performing the special tests like SLRs, the nerve root tension signs, the cross SLR, the boosting test, the femoral stress test, all get goes into the diagnosis and very important part which as all the spine surgeons will not uh, 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 give more, uh, rather uh, we'll say is the important part in uh, examining their OPD patient is a neurological examination. It not only helps to localize the pathology, but also objectively find the neurological deficit. What is the severity of deficit? And you can pick up those red flag signs which with the patient requires a close follow, whether the patient requires a, a further investigations or a follow up or a diagnostic follow up at a later date. They formulate them, they, whether it is, rad, uh, are they dealing with radiculopathy, myelopathy, plexopathy, peripheral neuropathy? A working diagnosis starts going into their head. And then, whether this myelopathy is a compressive one or a non compressive one, none of these uh, mentors will do the examination of the spine complete unless and until they come do the SI joint examination, check the hip joints, whether the hips are movable or the, is it the hip spine syndrome or the lower limbs? Is there a deformity which are looking the, down the uh, lower limb or there is a weakness in the lower limb? So all these areas or, or the so-called masquerading areas are always looked upon whenever they do the cursory examination of the patient in the OPD. After that, there is the next thing which is done is finding the differential diagnosis. What is the most likely in their head? What is the next in line and what it cannot be? So they never guess. They have, a, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has the data. So obviously all the data is formulated into their heads. They come up with this three, four differential diagnosis in the chronological order, the most likely being the top and the least being the downwards. And most likely is obviously thrown in the river bin. What is the next? Once, once they see the patient in OPD, the next thing to do is either do a clinical follow-up whenever you have a differential diagnosis, which are uh, probably not so malignant and a very benign one, which will can get better over a period of weeks or months will be followed up on a clinical follow-up after one month. Certain patients will require a diagnostic follow-up. A, a, a X-ray, which was looking naive, might turn out to be something bad at a later follow-up. So they always do some, there's something called as follow-up of the patient after one month. None of them will on the day one say that the patient is not having anything. They will always say that chances of it to be a very malignant thing or a very problematic thing is least. Let us follow up after one month's time with a therapeutic trial or giving some medicines. If you're not getting better, we will go for the next investigation. There are certain diagnostic aids, uh, aids like X-rays, MRI, CTs, we have depending upon the likely diagnosis or the differential, you can go for further more, that is PET CT. You can go for uh, still higher investigation if possible. Whenever you have a diagnostic dilemma, you do something called as biopsies. So once you have a differentials in your mind, you go for the next best investigation. So uh, nothing is very uh, clear uh, unless and until you do all these aids, all these diagnoses. When obviously you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be the truth. And this truth is nothing but the diagnosis. Uh, so this coming to a diagnose is, diagnosis in the patient setup, in an OPD setup is a challenge. There are uh, certain diagnostic conundrum which a, a surgeon or a clinician goes through. There are patient-related factors. The patient might be introvert. He may not divulge all the information which is required for the diagnosis. At times, the patient is frustrated visiting too many doctors and no one has really got the diagnosis and he feels the next one will be the similar one. So he starts hiding the information from you. Also, the another factor which is as a diagnostic conundrum is the cost. The patient may not be a well-to-do patient and in those cases, you might have to sort for something called as the, uh, a therapeutic trial and see whether the patient has a clinical follow-up. Is he worsening? Is he getting better? Uh, then you advise the patient investigation. 
yes diagnosis is very important when you are uh, thinking about uh, the treatment part but at times you have to sort for something called as therapeutic trial and a clinical follow up there are certain doctor factors related to diagnostic conundrum anchoring bias so in initial thought process might anchor you to those differentials and you may not revisit the patient with a different differentials which is a very important thing so you saw the circle the circle was of the working process where you might have to reconsider your differentials depending upon the next investigation you do the time is a very good factor i mean, I mean it's a very very critical factor uh, especially the masters which uh, we have right now all of them have 30 to 50 patients in their opd uh, they barely are able to manage uh, per patient five to seven minutes. So they can do it just because they are following the process. They are following the exact same process which is being dictated right now. And if they do it on continuous patient, the practice makes man perfect. You do it on a continuation process. You get to know which patient you need to give an extra one minute and which patient you can really subtract those one minute and call them on the next follow-up. Also, what is important is experience. These masters are all uh, have experience, uh, a huge experience uh, managing these patients. But for a young person who is opening his spine OPD on an orthopedic OPD, experience matters at times you might have to give more time to the patient if you are less experienced you tend to give more time as well as ask more uh, history or do a detailed clinical evaluation to come to diagnosis and if you have nothing against you what may be against you is the masquerade itself there are so many spinal conditions or rather non-spinal conditions, we can uh, mimic like a spinal conditions. You can have so many, the hip pain presenting like a back pain, a neuropathy presenting like a radiculopathy, a vasculopathy can presenting like neurological claudication. So it should be, you should take all these diagnoses with a pinch of salt, revisit the diagnosis. At times, revisit the patient, redo the examination and come to the clarity whether what kind of a patient and diagnosis you are dealing with. So at times, the diagnostic conundrum, you may not have different patients, you may not have many friends either, but you just got to have one go-to person. So Dr. Sherlock Holmes had uh, Dr. Watson. You can, this friend can be anyone. It might be your colleague in the same hospital or a different colleague all the way from a different uh, hospital, especially a revision case or a re-symptom uh, re case where the patient is coming back uh, with a similar problem. You are biased about your own case. So you can send the patients to your colleague or the senior or the junior and you tell them you uh, evaluate completely on your side you let me know what do you feel and we will move on the next case so so that's how you come to a diagnosis the diagnostic dilemma or a diagnostic conundrum and come to a final diagnosis what is exactly has to be done so these are the points where it, actually the failure occurs the opd timing is as short as my uh, presentation you have less than five minutes to deal with the patient the failure can be at the time of engaging the patient. Failure can be information gathering, integration, um, you interpreting the uh, information or, or the data. At times, uh, you have got the, all the hard work, you have diagnosed the case, but if you don't deliver the diagnosis in a fruitful and in a phase manner or being empathic to the patient and giving, it, giving the diagnosis in a phase manner, then you might lose the patient. So explaining the health, problem to the patient is again a critical part in the diagnosing and the treatment part of the patient. Also, once you have established the diagnosis, you have to put forth all the possible treatment options which are there with the patients. You explain them what are the pros and cons of each of them. Let them take a calculated decision. You can obviously as an expert, most of the time the patients will ask that, what do you feel? So I am um, sure all these experts will always have the say where they have to tell that this is a better option, but you have a, a, an alternate option with you, but these are the pros and cons of those options. Preferably go for this. You always explain them the risk involved for all the options and let them take a final decision about the same. So once you have uh, done the treatment plan, you have to explain how to go about the path. 
how do you do what do you do next if you have advised surgery if you have advised non surgical methods if you advise non surgical methods do you go to the physiotherapist what do you say to the physiotherapist do we do something called as home physiotherapy or should i visit the physiotherapist see as a patient they are confused they don't know first of all they are confused about the entire scenario they are confused more because you have now explained them the complicated jargon diagnosis so now they are further more con confused how to go about it so certain anxious patients might think that a simple uh, disc problem will be as bad as a cancer or a, a tumor condition they are dealing with they give a suddenly horrible disc uh, i mean uh, facial expressions that you feel that what exactly you have told to them is it really that bad then you explain them this this prolapse doesn't mean something very bad it is just a problem which majority people will have once in their lifetime and majority requires non surgical modality that comes there now immediately when you explain the treatment plan you give them the phase or the plan path of care based on their diagnosis and obviously uh, depending upon your further uh, Uh, interventions you tell the patient whether to go ahead in whatever manner possible so in short how do you approach for approaching this spine patient there are certain etiquettes certain ethos certain uh, principles or certain qualities you need to have as a spine surgeon you need to have a definite uh, excellent clinical yeah. acumen you need to be patient at times uh, with the patients you need to show professionalism to the patient that is something a very uh, important for engaging the patient you own the responsibility own the responsibility of the process as well as the diagnosis and uh, as well, as well as the execution of the treatment you might to be uh, you need to be observant not only uh, the prior part of your treatment or diagnosis also post your treatment whether the patient is having re uh, recurrence of the symptoms or he is having some other symptoms uh, you need to have a clear attitude or uh, you you can say an empathetic attitude towards the patient be competent be compassionate about whatever you are doing and at the end be you, the humility is the best key for any surgeon be it a spine surgeon or any uh, surgeon of any field if you have this um, all these important qualities which i am sure all these masters are having or beyond this i think you are good to do and managing the patient in opd thank you i think with this i will complete my talk thank you sir. thank you thank you pramod uh, it was a uh, important topic and it was really needed because uh, refreshing ourselves and uh, using that uh, <clears throat> you know uh, clinical acumen is most important thing and all these uh, things which uh, you have told and the diagnostic conundrum important for uh, all of us and as we age we mature and we become more sober and we uh we try to avoid mistakes which we have learned from our past and thank you for this beautiful topic and we move on to the next um uh, non academic topic yes yeah uh, so i have one one question uh, yes. a lot of times relatives comes uh, come with the with the mri report and uh, just the mri and they don't come with the patients so at that time should we should we explain our treatment and they want the, the final treatment what should be done so should we explain them without seeing the patient the final treatment or we should say no bring the patient and then only we will tell yes pramod yeah but I, i it's a very common scenario that they do something called as uh, diagnostic shopping they want to know the diagnosis and is the plan of treatment consistent with different surgeons so the many times it happens uh, in fact it happens among uh, four of us like they keep on jumping from one to the other uh, need uh, finding whether the same patient is having the same diagnosis and the same treatment plan or not but uh, it, uh, ethically uh, you can obviously uh, need not give uh, a written plan out to them and tell them what is the uh, final plan and uh, give them a final cost in what you should always tell them to get the patient to fire to adjourn final diagnosis and obviously the final treatment plan but many a times uh, I, what we do at uh, here we uh, definitely have a word with the patient itself by a call by a, a, a audio call or something like that and get the information from the patient and then uh, based on the uh, audio call or the audio conversation we have a clear idea that 
probably the patient has a neurological claudication and this can be because of whatever level the patient is having on the MRI. Uh, we always tell the relatives that the final decision will be taken on the after examining the patient, but more likely the patient is having this, then the treatment plan would be likely this, but nothing is given in writing. It is always uh, one line is written for a final clinical radiological correlation patient examination is required. Kindly get the patient for the next visit. Perfect, Pramod. I think uh, it's important to explain them, but uh, clinical examination of the patient is uh, mandatory. Because may, I, may, may I make a uh, comment, uh, Silesh? Yes, sir. So, uh, just a couple of weeks back, I had a patient. He was in his 30s. He came with extremely unbearable severe pain in the upper limb. We did an MRI, which showed a tumor at T1, T2. We sent to the neurosurgeons. They immediately said that we should operate the tumor. And they said the drag of the tumor is causing that arm pain. Fortunately, we have a system of a filter system like my uh, team, one after another, sees the patient. And Dr. Vignesh, who is part of my team, had studied the MRI, which I had also looked through, but it, I, I did not see that cut. It showed a disc at C, C5, C6. So despite the neurosurgeon saying that we needed to do the tumor, it didn't seem to match our findings. We decided to do just a cervical discectomy. If he had undergone this large tumor excision at the upper thoracic level, God knows what would have happened. But we did just a discectomy, dramatic relief, sent him home. So multiple people seeing at different times is very important. Never rush. Great learning lesson from uh, you, sir. Thank you uh, for this, Pramod. And uh, in view of time, we'll have to move on to the next uh, invited topic, uh, Dr. Himanju Kulkarni, uh, for the uh, practice in periphery challenges uh, we face. And Dr. Himanju is practicing at Sangli and Kolapur region of Maharashtra. Over to you, Himanju. Thank you, sir. I'm actually not at home, so I was not sure of the internet range here. So I've recorded my talk in the evening. So I'll just play that. So I'm right here. Good evening, all. Thank you, Shailesh sir, Ajay sir, Siddharth and Pramod for this opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, my topic today is spine practice in a tier 3 city. Is it a boon or a bane? So what prompted me to choose this topic is the relevance of the topic in this meet. I know the target audience. I know that there is a huge outreach of Pune Spine Weekend amongst practitioners from periphery, stalwarts guiding their juniors, and most importantly, amongst the fellows and young spine surgeons. So this is my message for all these people and especially the category three. To declare in the beginning itself, am I being a crybaby that I don't get to practice in Pune or Mumbai, I am practicing in a small city. Absolutely not. I know that some things can be a boon in some scenarios and bane in some scenarios. For example, a hummingbird can fly like anything, it can sing like anything, but it's a very small and tiny bird and it's a very weak bird. Anybody can crush that and kill that. On the contrary, an ostrich cannot fly at all. It has to run, but it's so mighty that it can fight a leopard. So your powers can be boon in some scenarios and bane in some scenarios. So what are the boons of practicing or what are the benefits of practicing uh, in uh, tier three cities as a spine surgeon? First and most important, getting your own establishment is very easy. The cost of real estate is very low as compared to metro cities, obviously. The land is always costly, but compared to metro cities, it is low. So if you have to form your 30 or 40 bedded hospital in Pune, it is going to be very costly. As compared to that, in three tier cities, it is going to be very cheap. So you can start your own establishment very easily and you can be the owner of your own setup. So it's very easy. So you can see an example here, this hospital is built in the middle of nowhere, or I would say in the middle of a farmland, but he's doing very well. Next important thing is minimum waiting period. When I came back to Sangli after finishing my fellowships, I was the first person to do exclusive spine surgery or as an exclusive spine surgeon for a long, long, long time. So that obviously gives you a benefit. When you go to metro cities like Pune or Mumbai or Ahmedabad or Delhi, there are already very much established stalwarts who are practicing there. So to create your own space, it takes a long time. As compared to that, in a tier three city, there is a fewer, there are fewer people who are going to do that thing. There is less competition. So it is very easy to get established very early. 
So what are the next trends? Human resources. Human resources are very cheap. You end up paying way less than what you pay to staff in Pune than in Sangli. Many of the setups make a mockery of minimum wage act by paying a pittance. So the amount you spend on the salaries is very less as compared to amount you uh, pay in Pune. Sorry. Next important thing is fringe benefits. This is the fun. This is the most satisfying part. The fringe benefits are this is my loyal brother or assistant who is assisting me in spine surgery since last four years, and he is good. And without any hesitance, I can give a root retractor in his hand during surgery. And without any hesitance, I can pick up my phone and call him to help me in my gardening duties on Sundays. This is only possible when you are practicing in a small city or a rural area. This is never possible in a uh, tier three city. So see, these are the fringe benefits which you enjoy in uh, tier three cities. Next is social status. You are the super specialist here. You have an aura. So your social status skyrockets in a very early stage. It's a good thing to feel. You cannot let that go to your head. So that is everybody's perspective. But your social status, you gain it very early. And since it's a small city, everybody knows you. All patients know you. You get a good social status very early in your career. You just have to maintain that very nicely all throughout. Strengths. See, you all always have to understand these small tier three cities are always the political cities. In Sangli district itself, we have five running medical colleges. If we combine the medical colleges in four surrounding districts, we have eleven medical colleges, which is a number higher than Mumbai or Pune or Delhi or Ahmedabad. So, if somebody who is going to come as a spine surgeon, he doesn't want to go through the hassles of getting his own setup and wants to get attached at an institute as a spine surgeon, he has ample amount of uh, opportunities available and. The ratio is different because the uh, uh, people approaching the institute is less, and institutes are more. So it is always going to get easy to get an attachment when you are practicing at a tier three city. Next important thing is less perils of CPA Consumer Protection Act. See, there are troublemakers in every walk of your life. There are always going to be, but rural patients are less. I won't say less, slightly less demanding than metropolitan or urban patients. They won't slap you with a uh, lawyer's notice every now and then. Yeah, they may get some goons to your OPD sometimes. That is very routine in our area. But CPA and court kachery and all, you don't have to go through that very often here. So these were the nice things. What were the these were the bains, the goons? Now, what are the bains? What are the frustrations? First, most important thing is when you get trained at good places. I got trained at Sanjeevi Hospital and then Savoy Hospital, then Bombay, then Strong Clinic, then Royal Orthopedic Hospital. When you get trained at these standard institutes, and when you come back to your own place to practice, start a practice, you have some standards which are set in your own brain. Things you want to go according to some plan or some protocol, because you have seen how the standard protocols and how standard people work. When you come back from doing all these fancy foreign fellowships and useful, I won't say fancy, useful foreign fellowships, this is what happens to you. You feel like Mohan Bhargav in Swades. Surrounded by villagers with lack of skills and absolutely frustrated, you can see the look on Sharu Khan's face in this picture. This is exactly how you feel when you come back, because there is lack of trained staff in OT, in wards, in receptions. These fringe benefits which I spoke about are absolutely negated by the strange mannerisms. And just to give a small example, this brother which I was talking about, he started just with me, and he was also a new guy, so he was not trained at all. He was trained by my father in OT mannerisms and all. After a few days, he came back to me. Uh, he came to me and said, "Ki sir, uh, we have done a lot of cases in last month. We had to, uh, sir, humko wo apple screw hai na? Apple screw mangana padega." I was like, "Apple screw? Apple screw kya hota hai, boy?" Bola, sir, ham log karte na, wo spine mein dalte hai apple screw hai, wo khatam hone ko hai, humko mangana padega." I was like, "What is apple screw?" I was like, "Sir, phal ke naam ka kuch rehta hai na? There is something with the name of the fruit." Then it clicked me. I was like, "Bhai, tu banana cage bol raha hai kya?" It was like, "Haan, sir, banana cage, banana cage." So this is the level of staff which you get who cannot differentiate between an apple and banana. The education level is that, but you cannot help with that because you cannot get all BACs and highly trained staffs in tier three cities. So the most important thing is administrative hassles here. Qualified MBAs these are scarcely available in tier three cities because these courses are mostly available in big cities and big cities have so many hospitals that everyone that comes out it, it is absorbed by the big hospitals and big cities. So what we have to do is we have to adjust with low cost safe self proclaimed managers. These are an absolute training nightmare. You have to tell them everything, teach them everything. But ultimately, you are not an MBA college. 
you are just telling them your own experiences so ultimately even if something derails even slightly if something slightly goes off course ultimately the things land on your head and you are the ultimate task master you have to get that job done because he lacks the skill to manage all these things he is not a trained manager so sometimes i feel am i a doctor who manages his own hospital or am i a hospital administrator who operates fine in the mornings and believe me it's a very thin line on most days i lean more on the right side than on the left side i am more of a hospital manager administrator than a doctor so this is what your week looks like something is wrong with iit we on monday then on tuesday something is wrong with light microscope microscope lights then on wednesday you have to change the filters of the laminar airflow then thursday the burr is not working saturday you get to know that the ecto is it etco2 probe is not working because it is very difficult to do ga cases fine cases without etco2 probe so you have to look after all these administrative duties every day because this is going to hamper your life and on saturday you have to manage your better half because that is non negotiable so if you sum up the administrative responsibility or the managing responsibilities of your week this is what your week look like all the administrative or management responsibilities with your better half so what is the issue with administrative hassles is you have to have high end gadgets it is impossible to practice without them these days but quick service when you are not staying in the metros it is impossible to get because all these guys are stationed in pune or hyderabad or bangalore or delhi or mumbai so what happens is if you have to take their appointment they reach to you after 3 or 4 or 5 days you cannot stop your work during that time so what we have to do is if you cannot postpone your case then you have to repair it on your own so we do video calls and we call them and we sometimes do some uh, desi jugad and we get it done next important thing is finances of the patient what we get is always an uninsured class i would say 95% is uninsured class for this class health is never a priority their first priority is always somebody's marriage or uh, some death in the family so what happens is a simple problem which would have been operated with a simple surgery two years back now it has become more much more complex after two and a half years and you have to do a much more complex surgery now and then again for a complex surgery there is always a cost restriction that becomes a major hurdle and even for your own comfort if you want to use a percutaneous pedicle screw or a nice imported screw set with good instrumentations you cannot do that because the patient cannot afford that so more than patients most of the times you have to tell yourself ki doctor sir itne paise mein itna ich milenga control yourself so if i have to buy a robotic 4k microscope or if i have to buy a o oh, arm disclaimer i cannot afford any of this right now don't worry this is just for the sake of the discussion so if i have to buy a robotic zeiss microscope with 4k display or a co arm i always have to tell myself that buying this does not increase the spending capacity of my whole region if i am going to buy a co arm the patient is not going to automatically pay me more he will pay whatever the average is of my region so these things are for your own operative and own comfort for your own safety and your own peace of mind i would say for patient safety so what happens if i do this this is what i end up like i buy a ferrari for a muddy shitty road and i get stuck into a pothole so you will always have to remember you do something like this when you are more advanced than your entire province you end up like this a ferrari stuck in a pothole so if you cannot afford a ferrari for your own comfort for your own peace of mind you always have to do some cost effective desi jugad and be comfortable like this but you have to be comfortable and do some jugad because you cannot always afford a ferrari rather you can but your city and your people cannot next important thing which disturbs me the most is the academic suffers in all this see academics you cannot progress without academics what happens is some day if i decide that today i am going to finish my opd early i take my rounds and i finish my half written protocol which i which i was supposed to submit for uh, my next prospective trial so what happens is i go for a round some patient tells me sir the room was not clean since morning the mouse came very late you have to tell your staff i control my anger i go to the next room somebody tells me sir the remote is, the remote of the tv is not working as like how is the patient patient is fine but the remote is not working then i control my anger somehow then i come to my opd i get a call from my uh, ot supervisor that sir we have two major cases tomorrow but our autoclave is not working at this step at this step then you go into zen mode what academics what paper what research 
I just have to go to home. I have to crash into the bed and finish this bloody day. And this is what happens and it boils down to one thing, apathy towards academics. So in conferences, all the big guys tell us that you have, have to publish or you will perish. But it is easier said than done when you're operating your own hospital. So to sum up, what am I saying here? Am I saying that after considering all the pros and cons, do I suggest that it is better to settle in metros? Absolutely no way. This is not what I'm saying. So that's why I have put four goods and bads in front of you guys. So tips and bits for fresh pass outs are, you have to form a pool of instruments. Always have a spare instrument whenever it is possible because if you break something, you are in a soup. Compromise with car and interior, please. You may have to do that in initial phases of your career because you have to have to invest in good laminar flow, quality IITVs, burrs and microscopes and now endoscopes and good quality implants. Because these are the things which are going to make your life comfortable and not a car. You're going to sit in your car for five minutes, but you're going to use a nice microscope for four to five hours a day. So to summarize, quality doctors need quality environment for practicing what they have learned. Rural or urban technical challenges are always the same. Remember Pasha's confession at his deathbed. It's a very beautiful line. Germs are nothing. Terrain is everything. So whatever germ you are, it is important where you cultivate yourself for good growth and not what type of germ you are. The terrain where you grow yourself is important and not what type of person you are. And the place at top is always vacant. So you can be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond. But also remember, if you're persistent enough and if you're patient enough, you can always be a big fish in a big pond. So remember, hummingbird and ostrich, both are gifted in their own ways. So I'll just finish with a very famous and very well-known share. I think you all must be knowing this. So it goes like this. So practice so thank you. I hope it was useful for all. And thank you for giving me this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So good evening. Thank you, Shaila, sir, Ajay, sir, Siddharth and Pramod for this opportunity. Sorry, sorry. It's a wonderful yeah, Some questions someone is asking. I think, uh, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. It is uh, uh, absolutely stunning. I think I would call it an oration. It's not a talk. It's like an oration that, uh, you know, it is like convincing these uh, young spine surgeons and fellows that don't go after the glamour of Pune and Mumbai. Everything is possible if you have it in this. So amazing talk, Himanshu. Uh, big round of applause for Himanshu. It's a great talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank yeah, you for this opportunity. Himanshu, we wake here. Yeah, we wake. Yeah. yeah. Himanshu, yes, uh, yeah. and then I can really relate with you because yeah. whatever you have said is similar condition of mine. Uh, my, I think what I feel is uh, instead of having all the expensive gadget, I think we should practice what we know best and that can give us a better name and uh, whichever place we are practicing, if we can produce good results with whatever good surgical skills taught by our mentors, I think that is the best thing we can offer to our society. Absolutely. So, and th that is what matters, what you were taught. And fortunately, we have been taught very well. Yeah. That's why we are doing the well. Yes, yeah, Sajan, sir. Final comment. Uh, <clears throat> I think this was a wonderful talk. Very, very well put. Absolutely uh, kudos to the young youngster. And I, I appreciate and applaud his uh, effort to go and start a spine center in a remote area. I think this is the future in India. There will be many such young spine surgeons who will be venturing into the tier three, tier four cities and doing good work and they will be recognized for it. And as long as you do within your limits, don't push the limits and don't do dangerous stuff. Do what is possible in your setup and refer the ones uh, which are more complicated to the centers you're comfortable with. That's the best way to go. You will make a name and slowly grow. There is no doubt about it. Absolutely. I think thank Himanshu, you. Thank you, thank you for here. a wonderful uh, presentation. No, no words. I, can, I think it's it's going to inspire a lot many uh, youngsters uh, from all across Indian subcontinent. And uh, thank, uh, we move on to the next topic. And again, that's a very very interesting and important topic for all of us. 
from none other than Bala uh, from Chennai. Dr. Bala Mur, uh, is a noted neurosurgeon and he has something which we all can learn from uh, Hamsa Rehab and Doctrinership. What is entrepreneurship? And we all as doctors, we know how to go in the morning to the OPD, OT, do things and come out. But how we can contribute to the society by doing something which is possible is what Bala is going to talk to us. Over to you, Bala. Uh, please uh, share your screen. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, just give me one second. Um, just uh, restarting my computer. If you can just ask one more question to somebody, I'll just have a little technical problem. I'll just take one minute. Yeah, Dheeraj was asking something to Himanshu. Over to you, Dheeraj. Uh, no, no. So I was uh, extremely impressed with the way Himanshu has presented. He has presented this talk uh, through his uh, heart and uh, uh, I really loved the way he has presented uh, this talk. Uh, and I also, uh, what he just uh, mentioned uh, about his setup, I think his setup is quite uh, good uh, and it is quite uh, uh, equivalent to any uh, metro setup because uh, even, even in the biggest uh, public hospitals and I work in a medical college, uh, th this kind of setup is uh, uh, having a modular OT, see, uh, and having a microscope and having all these uh, gadgets, which may not be uh, uh, imported one, but uh, you have all these things. Okay, uh, I just I want I want to tell you a small thing. If the right now uh, uh, in Maharashtra, many uh, medical colleges also don't have modular OTs. Okay, the public public uh, hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, you, you are working extremely well, you are on right track and having a specialized center in uh, Tire 2, uh, Tire City is, uh, I think that has to be appreciated. Uh, yeah, Harpreet also <laughs> wanted to say something. Yes, Harpreet. Thank you, sir. Because Thank I am also practicing in Kanpur, you can say. So there are not many spine surgeons here, but we have a decent setup here. So I think practicing in a Tier 3 city, we always have to see we do basic spine surgery well. Uh, which covers more, most of the 95% of the cases and 5% of the cases, I think we should know where to restrict in our yeah, setup. Yeah, where to yeah, stop. Yeah, yeah. You cannot be too heroic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with Harpreet, you and Himanchu, because uh, when the Amazon came, it was targeting first Mumbai, Delhi and Bangalore. But uh, now uh, the sale is more in tier 2 and tier 3 cities than the metro cities. You know? That is what is going to happen because its its technology is going to be everywhere and there is nothing called as tier 2 or tier 3 because everything is available everywhere and we can uh, give good results everywhere. That's There is no question about it. Thank yeah. you guys and we move on to the most awaited talk of the day. Uh, the man himself, Bala Murli from Chennai and hi Bala, thank you for giving us time for today's uh, 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 Spine Weekend as uh, a doc printer and we want to know what we can uh, learn from you. Thank you, Bala. And Hi, thank, thank, thank you very much uh, for the team, uh, Siddharth, Tesh, and everybody else uh, who's uh, invited me. Um, probably it's the first time I'm sharing in a public forum about some of my experiences, and I want to make it more of a story. Um, and I just wanted to start off with a very different story. Um, I'm sure most of you know Elizabeth Taylor. Um, you know, she's one of the most popular Hollywood uh, actress. Um, and um, she was married for the eighth time and her eighth husband on the day of the wedding was like walking around and worried and uh, so one of his friends came and asked him, you know, what's the problem? Why are you worried? And uh, he said that, oh, you know what? You know, Elizabeth's been married uh, seven times. Um, I'm the eighth husband. So, hey, so what? You know, you know what you're doing. Uh, but he said that, yeah, but how do I make a difference? And, you know, that she would remember me and keep me for the rest of the life. So I'm the eighth speaker here today. So I got the same feeling that, you know, after Star Wars, like, you know, Dr. Sajin Hegde and, Ab, and, and Abbai Nini and Neeraj and Guru, how I'm going to create an impact and impression on people's mind. So my talk here today is going to be on why only be a doc and not a doc pruner. So uh, I've got these three, four logos here, and I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Uh, is to say that of a lot of things I've done, these were the four successful. So that's my first thing is not that I've done these and I've been successful. I've done more than these and I've started doing more. So the first definition of what is an entrepreneur, a person who sets up a business or businesses taking on financial risk with profit. Commonly, these people are innovators. They have source of idea of goods, service, or some procedure. Today, I'm not going to give you a formula on a plate. 
about how to become a startup or an entrepreneur because this is a journey that you have to experience and there is no formula anybody can give you ever if you ever think that you can go to a consultant who will tell you how to do a startup that means you've been ripped off your money so you know i just want to put some thoughts in your mind before i share my journey because my journey is something that many people have done i mean i'm no exception we all finished 12th grade and you know we all come up with our parents come up with this ambition as to what your child has to do but you know the days are changing because no more you decide it is byjus who decides what you're going to study and akash and everything else is going to teach you what need studies you would do what your jit and iit because education is a huge business and one of the top businesses in the world is byjus there's a lot of debate going on now about their valuation but let's not go there then you enter into medical school and did you know that about 45% of medical seats in india are in the private again you have to pay money you have to sh- shell a lot of money and the more south you come the more expensive it gets the more north you go maybe it's slightly cheaper so again you spend a lot of money in education then you come up to post graduation you take up whether you like what you like or you don't like you end up doing a post graduation for the sake of it and then what next you come out and you don't know what to do urban rural private practice government practice mixture of two full time retainer so there's all this confusion you are where to start how to start when to start and from day one of you qualifying you are in a race you are in a race not just against your peers your colleagues but your seniors and your boss sometimes the boss feels that your junior is a threat if he is extremely very good yeah i'm sure you know a lot of people would agree to that so you have this confusion of you know professionalism academics finance family dreams passions you know what do you do and everybody confuses you do we ever seek any counseling are there courses that people run how to survive private practice is there medical law do we know about business planning do you go meet the finance guy on the first day you start business you learn that over the next 5 to 10 years and you think that you know you know what you're doing whether you take private practice or public practice there is going to be a lot of problems because you still have to be an administrator you still have to know finance you still have to know strategy and you still have to know many things because even government practice is not easy though covid has given us a lot of you know goodwill and you know covid warriors there is a lot of negative publicity doctors are rip offs private hospitals have you know taken away money and they have you know drained all my resources so healthcare is a very very complex business the reason i say healthcare business it's got two components it's got healthcare and it's got business you have to have skills in both of them the costs are rising and i just want to give you some statistics of india in 2016 the healthcare spending was 110 billion in 22 it is three fold increase to 272 billion and you know what india has got the one of the healthcare has got the largest employers next to probably the indian railway about 4.7 million people and every year there's the 2.5 million people added and 500000 every year the gdp is going to rise the government spending on on healthcare is also on the rise from 1.3 it's 2.1 maybe in a few years it might be go up to 2.5 you know the financial year 21 insurance companies underwrit underwritten uh, insurances for as much as 7.9 billion which is you know almost 13% more than the previous years medical tourism is increasing e-commerce is increasing government is going to spend more so no matter how smart you are how many gold medals you have how much confidence and skills that you gain in training all over the world you still have to be a good leader you still have to have marketing skills you still need to understand business even if you are only working in a corporate hospital it is still a business you have to manage your staff your secretary your trainee your junior you need to form strategy so you need to understand business and finance and you know private healthcare though accounts for 58% we only own 30% of hospital beds but 81% of doctors work in the private so you can see the disproportion that we have and doctors have a lot of myth and i want to just clear three myths the first myth is doctors think that oh we don't need marketing we need we are, i'm i'm highly qualified i'm highly trained i can do the surgery that nobody does in my city but hey those days are gone everybody needs marketing even the gods need marketing you know the amount of money that tirupati spends on marketing is more than the thumb indian tourism government that spends on tourism in india do they really need it people are still going to go there 
next point i want to clarify is you know we have this myth about how we project ourselves so this is a picture taken from our one of the tourism websites you can see that you know this is taj mahal hey come and visit us you know this is a fantastic monument made of marble it's so many years old and blah 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 and you show this picture and i said yeah okay fine but imagine if your practice is like this and then you show this next slide and you say that hey this is the taj mahal you don't need to say anything would anybody not be inspired to go and see this well this is what we need to do you may be qualified you may have all the skills but if you don't communicate to your patient your colleagues your academic teams if you don't know how to present in a meeting and how to present to a patient then you're losing out those skills you need to be on social media and if you're not on reels today then you're out of the game the next thing is we are all shy about saying that oh we earn money we think that earning money is wrong i'm not saying everybody but majority of people are shy to admit that i am earning good money in healthcare business because you know nothing comes free and we provide quality service so the service sector we are probably the most complex service sector which is available and why not we should be not charge money for good quality work because we have to pay our own bills as well so every year there are 42000 post graduates who train 20% go abroad but 80 percent stay in the urban and in the private so healthcare has a lot of problems you know with rising cost diversity um and the you know disparity between rural and urban with the nursing shortages and the brain drain of not just doctors you know two three decades ago it was doctors who were draining who have been drained but now you have nurses you have paramedics physiotherapists occupational therapists you cannot find them after two years they want to go abroad so we need solution india needs solution to problems you have to fix the problem and you have to think differently and you have to innovate yourself and at the same time you need solutions in your hand people want services in their doorstep and that is the way that covid has taught people that they can demand and we have to think about the future and it is a combination of things the patient the private the public the peers and institutions so i'm just going to tell my little story of how i came into becoming an accidental i would say an entrepreneur i had never thought that i would you know uh, become uh, do something like this so i trained in the uk i was there for 16 years um i went to us i spent a couple of years in the us then i went to travel around both in the us and europe so i was with fessler i was his fellow for one year and then with dieter grob in switzerland and then i came back after being a consultant in nottingham for 3 years i came to india and i saw this big disparity acute care was fantastic so when i operated a patient with a stroke or a head injury or a spinal cord injury i forgot about them they went to a rehab center and uh, they were taken care of but here every patient came back to you so there's a big disparity about acute and chronic health care and i when i came to ganga hospital as a consultant in 2012 and i'm very proud to say that siddharth who's done extremely well was one of my fellows um i found that in ganga hospital there was about 150 to 160 asia a spinal cord injuries at that point um and um, when i spoke to dr akshay and i said that who else would start rehabilitation for patients apart from you you are the premier institution in the country it took me time to convince him but he was very gracious enough and said go and do what you can and let's see how it works and it's at that point that i started to explore i had worked in stoke mandeville in london as part of my training um, and i had some understanding about rehabilitation and the need for rehabilitation and so i thought that i need to explore and do my homework so i went to isic i spent about 10 days there i went to cm civil and did for 10 days i went to every part of asia because i've seen the west i've seen us europe and uk but i don't know how it works in the in asia so i went to jakarta chiang mai um i went to nepal dhaka korea so i went to every center i spent time over a six month period to understand how the business works how the healthcare financing works for spinal cord injury and then i came up and i'm very happy to say that i started off the ganga spinal cord injury center and that again came with innovation the problem was how do we convince patients to accept rehabilitation so this was a challenge this was the biggest question mark okay you offer rehabilitation you may open up a center but how do they accept it so that was the biggest problem and people did not want rehab people said oh you are not going to make me walk so i don't want rehab so that's when i thought how do i fix this problem so i went over to rotary 
So I became a Rotarian and I went to Rotary and I said, I have a problem. I have people who need rehabilitation. I have a hospital that's able to provide, but the patients are not ready to pay money. So we started a program with an international funding. And now we have had seven national grants, international grants for this. And we started off by involving Rotary and we gave free treatment to almost 60 patients just in one ward at Ganga Hospital. And we got an award for this through the Rotary Club and as one of the best projects by Abdul Kalam about a year before he died. So it was innovation. It was thinking. It is lateral thinking. And I thought that how can I fix this problem? This convinced when we were able to do this, this convinced Dr. Raj Shagran to say, okay, this is going to work. I'm making a difference to patients. So you have to influence the influencers. So you have to influence the decision makers, even in your hospital. If you want to get something innovative in your department, you have to convince your hospital, your management, that this is going to work and this is what I have done. So this is where I learned a lot about these things. Then I started setting goals and then I realized that if you don't live your dream, you will be living dream, you know, living in somebody else's dream, especially in the corporate world. So then I moved over to Chennai and I started to think big. Until that point, I didn't realize that a doctor can also be an entrepreneur. A doctor can also gain skills of business to know how to manage things. And then I started thinking differently. I started doing a lot of research. And in Chennai, when I came, I understood three things which I wanted to share. One is how to start up as a business. And the story of Hamsa Rehab was, again, um, it took me two years in Ganga Hospital to start a rehab, but it took me four years in Chennai to start a rehab because everybody I went to for money and I said that, hey, I have an idea. I want to invest. They said, okay, fine. How much do you want? I said, X number of money I need. But the next question was, how do I do it? Who is the team? Who's going to partner with you? Who's going to join with you to do this? So it was a very, very difficult process because real estate is in a, in a city is very expensive. You do not have a full-hearted corporate hospital who wants to invest money. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this with all the savings that I had, my pension money that I brought from UK. I said, let me start this and let me see what happens. Within six months, Kaveri Hospital in Chennai, which is one of the, uh, one of the uh, leading uh, corporate setups, they said that they liked the idea. They came and joined with me. So we took them as a partner. And we started Hamsa Rehabilitation. And I started many programs within Hamsa for weight loss. We started programs for back and neck program. And from a five-member team, now today we have 56 members and we have spread across um, almost six centers in Tamil Nadu. And we are coming up with our largest center in the next two months with 50 dedicated rehab beds and a 25,000 square foot area of rehab in Tiruchi, which is down south from uh, Chennai. So, the, so it was a lot of idea and thinking and thought processes that went inside. So this is how business you have to think about because it is possible because the doctor is the best person who understands the needs and requirements. The second challenge I saw as an innovation was service. So again, I want to give you an example. One of the things that I very passionately do is I operate a lot of pediatric children, both spine and brain. The spinal cord anomalies are one in thousand in India. In South India, it is about three to eight because of many reasons, folic acid, poor scanning. And again, I started seeing a lot of patients in my practice and especially in the government setup, they started referring patients who required surgery, but were not able to afford. So again, I went back to Rotary and I went to the government. So I thought, well, I cannot help the poor. I cannot deal with this problem. Rehabilitation is something different, but this is a very basic problem. So one of the largest hospitals in India Children's Hospital is in Chennai. It's called the Chennai Egmo Children's Hospital. And this hospital gives right to 20,000 births in three months. 20,000. So if you look at the number of anomalies, if you calculate three per thousand, you can imagine the number of children born with brain and spine abnormality. So this is a government problem. So I went and met the chief minister, the health minister and everybody. And I said that, hey, you know, we have a team of doctors, a hospital and Rotary to help you. If you subsidize and reduce the cost, then we can provide a service to these people because the government hospital was not able to cope with the number of children. So we started a very big project. We had a funding for about 60 lakhs uh, from abroad through Rotary. And we started a project called Talirgal. Talirgal means, you know, it's a young bud. 
and we operated a huge amount of patients, 65 patients completely free. And the way it worked is the children born in the government hospital, they would come to Kaveri for surgery and then they will go back to the government hospital where we would go and take care of them in the NICU because these were children as, as the small as one kg of weight, preterm babies born with congenital abnormalities. So we were able to give 65 children so far in the last three years um, uh, free surgery and we've really given life to at least 60 of those children. Five of them, we have lost them. So again, this led to a formation of a community rehab and a lot of NGOs identified the work we did and they came and joined and we've taken over three NGOs in Chennai um, and we take care of almost 150 children with severe disabilities, multiple disabilities and we've started a community rehab service there. So this was a service demand where I found a solution. Again, innovation, you have to think about different ways in which you do education. So before COVID came, we started the spine boot camp and various innovate works. And again, this was through innovation. How can you give education that is required for the current generation? I will not go too much into it. And now very recently, we started a rehabilitation for children where we actually gave rehabilitation um, at a very, very affordable cost, but with high technology. So the Hamsa Rehab for Kids has the latest of technology, robotics, motion sensor, VR, because we wanted to make it fun for children. I wanted to show a video, but I don't want to uh, because we are running short of time. So business is not easy. It hurts. If you don't do it right, it will screw you. So why should you still do it? You need to have a passion. You need to be scalable. You need to be able to sustain it. You need to be relevant to you. You cannot go and start a restaurant. You can with support. There's no point in you going and starting a restaurant business, but you can do so many things in healthcare which need solution and fixing. So what are the qualities of an entrepreneur as a doctor? You need to have a mindset. You need to be a risk taker. You have to accept failure. I've started more than what I've shown you. I've failed in many and I've, then I've succeeded. You have to balance your clinical skills and business. But remember, when you start anything as an entrepreneur, your business becomes 10 times more. From operating 15 to 20 patients, I operate 40 to 50 patients now because of all the other things that I've done. You have to learn management skills. You have to adopt to change. You have to work hard because you're actually doubling your time now. You're not just a clinician, but also you're a fitness person. You're also uh, you know, a person with passion and you also are running a business. You have to be innovative. You have to find modern ways of doing it. Financial knowledge, you have to network with people. You have to create a very good team. The team is the key and you have to be able to delegate jobs and find things. So I just want to close my conversation by saying that the two best examples I've taken is one from the West and one from India is the Mayo brothers. They were doctors. They started off their practice and clinic by just exploring. The two brothers were sent by their father to travel around the world and understand everything. So the Mayo brothers, they went from England to Europe to Asia to find out how to run a healthcare business. What is the best way that you can provide good quality service? And then our own example from Apollo Hospital in Chennai, where Dr. Pratap Reddy and his whole family have created a huge chain in Asia of Apollo hospitals. Um, so, so these were doctors who became entrepreneurs. And I think who better than doctors can actually understand about healthcare? Who better than us know the problem of the healthcare and the business? So why should we shy away from being entrepreneurs and being able to explore and experiment? We have to balance the clinical, academic, and the business. And you have to find yourself within this. You have to do this only if you have a passion. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Not everybody can be a leader. Not everybody can do everything. But if you try to explore within you and find yourself fit within that, then you must think about it. So you are the brand. So you are the hero. So you have to think about this because every doctor is an entrepreneur within his own business. So that's why my question is, why only be a doctor? And we doctors should be entrepreneurs in thinking of that way uh, and trying to explore. So um, I thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you, Ajay. And Ajay also was one of my fellows when I was in uh, um, Ganga Hospital. And it's really lovely to see you all guys. Thank you. Amazing talk, uh, Dr. Bala. It is really an eye-opener. And I must say, the journey you have traveled 
from being a consultant in the UK, coming back to India, and I think starting it all over again and again succeed. I think uh, hats off, hats off means uh, I have no words. I have no words. So it was a great talk and congratulations for a wonderful, I would again call this an oration. This is not a talk, but this is an oration. Thank you. I agree. Fantastic, Fantastic talk. Uh, un unmatched and uh, it, it's, it's stepwise, you know, you, you, the way you have explained it, it's, it's really inspirational. I can say only one word, inspirational. And let's hear from Sajan, sir. <clears throat> uh, I want to congratulate uh, Bala for his wonderful enterprise. He's truly an entrepreneur and a doctor as well and a neurosurgeon as well. I wish him all the best. I think he has shown a path for a lot of young people. I think, uh, uh, I don't know if I have been an entrepreneur ever, but I've just tried to do what is best possible in the area of spine surgery. For me, that was a very, very small focus on which I, I put about 25, 30 years of my life in, into. But I, I, I truly admire all these youngsters coming uh, with new ideas, uh, like that young doctor who started in a tier two city and like Dr. Bala has done. It is uh, kudos to them. They are a fantastic bunch of youngsters. They are the future of India. Thank you very much, sir. That's very nice of you. Thank you, Bala. And uh, I think uh, we, we all will uh, cherish this uh, fine weekend with all these beautiful uh, talks uh, which uh, were needed for our, all of us. And we move on to the last uh, bit, uh, last leg of the uh, symposium. Interesting cases and we'll rapid fire. Uh, uh, Ajay, uh, Harpreet and Siddharth will be showing uh, the... Uh, interesting cases and uh, we will move on with Ajay Kotari. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I've got uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Sir. Yeah, perfect. So no, film just, screen is required. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. F5. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Can you can you ski now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'll just show a couple of uh, cases, like two deformity and two uh, tumor cases, which are very interesting. I'll not take much of time. I know we have already shot the time, but uh, as we were talking about technology and we were talking about innovations, I think what we really have uh, a different thing that we have started doing over the last two years is using this OAM and navigation. And we can see Dr. Shailesh and Dr. Pramod, you know, being at the forefront of using this technology and then translating really these complex deformities and tumor cases and helping giving good outcomes and good uh, uh, solutions for this complex problem. So I will not take much of time. This is a 16 year old boy who presented very late. He had come when he had, uh, he was at the age of 11. And you can see this is the deformity, right thoracic, left lumbar curve. And you can see the gross deformity, which is there. These are his x-rays. These are the MRI and uh, CT scan images. And you can see there is a hyperlaxity element to his deformity. And you can see the hyperkyphotic spine, which this gentleman has. You can see the high arch palate, thumb sign, wrist sign. There is an arm span of 168. So everything pointing towards a complex deformity with a, a syndromic element to it. So what differently, like initially managing these deformities, what not very easy because of the complex nature and putting the pedicle screw in these complex deformities. But now with the advent of these intraoperative scanners and the GPS navigation, this deformity correction procedures have become quite safer and easy. And it really translates into good clinical outcome. And you can see after doing uh, 611 Pontes osteotomies, we've used cobalt chrome rods and uh, doing a convex side first using a cantilever principle, laminar decortication done we could achieve a good deformity correction in this 
boy who had got a kyphoscoliotic spine and this is the amount of deformity correction that we have got so the key the why this slide has been put up is the amount of rotations that we see in these pedicles the osteotomies that we need to plan is very complex but this really helps in a good execution of these cases in these complex deformities second case again a girl with a complex deformity a scoliosis with a coronal decompensation ribham main thoracic and lumbar curve again if we go this is a adolescent idiopathic scoliosis lenke 1c and you can see a good correction which is easily possible again with a good intraoperative navigator this is a kyphosis the reason why i put up this is we can see the wedge that we can calculate and this is a pvcr that was done in this particular boy so the biggest advantage why this case is showcased is we can actually calculate the wedge intraoperatively using the navigation so that we can plan the osteotomy in such a way that that amount of wedge can be removed and a good deformity correction can be achieved uh, coming to the second last case is this case of aneurysmal bones this is a 16 year old male with thoracic myelopathy this is the x ray and you can see this is a d8 vertebral body with uh, a lesion in the vertebral body spinous process and the lamina and there is a cord compression you can see this cord compressed and thoracic myelopathy in this young boy these are the t2 weighted axial stir coronal images this is a ct scan and you can see the tumor almost engulfing the complete body pedicle and the lamina so this case me and dr shailesh we operated together and the best part again of this complex this tumor that we operated was intraoperatively we could you can see we could judge the amount of extent of the tumor intraoperatively which for a naked eye is is very much not possible so now this is a pre surgery shoot that we have taken and we have gauged the tumor we have got the margins of the tumor we know where the exact part of the tumor that has to be resected now this is a video wherein we can exactly see you know how the tumor resection can easily be possible using an intraoperative navigation so here we can see that after we have done a complete so now where does this help us is we can see that after excising the complete tumor we can again see the navigation so these are the intraoperative images and after excising the complete tumor we have packed it with a good amount of bone graft you can see and these are the post surgical reconstructing images all intraoperative
so this boy went on to have a great recovery and the complete fusion happened and uh, it's been a two year follow up this boy is living a complete normal life and coming to the last case this is an osteochondroma at c6 vertebral level and you can see this is the x ray this is the mri again a cervical myeloradiculopathy with a big tumor causing a cord compression you can see this is a tumor which is extending from the uh, lamina of this c5 vertebral body and causing a cord compression so now how to tackle this complex case so the best part about the intraoperative navigation is it really tells you the extent of the tumor margin where the tumor is located and after excising the tumor whether the tumor has been completely removed or not or is there any remnant of the tumor which is still remaining because then it is a very important thing that the recurrence rate is very high if a big part of the tumor is left there and you can see after burying out the tumor this is the tumor that we are burying out A big part of tumor that has been taken out and this is a post operative image we can see we have done a laminectomy and we have excised the complete tumor and this is the post operative image so thank you very much uh, i'll cut it short uh, in want of time and uh, the whole purpose of presenting this was that technology as dr bala said and uh, the good surgical skills a uh, good combination of both these things really help in translating the thing into a good clinical outcome thank you very much beautiful cases ajay excellent uh, use of the technology as well um, and uh, what we feel that you really can uh, plan that uh, you know okay, removal of the tumor you can see the margins how much lesion you really want to resect wide marginal resection which you can check it real time in uh, navigation that's a big advantage any questions uh yeah shailesh uh, i have a question uh, ajay and as well as you both can answer since you are using wa so right now i am taking a demo of a company uh, for a navigation and they are doing a, a ct scan prior to the surgery and uh, intraop they are trying to uh, we are trying to put the screws uh, with that help. so uh, during that uh, look, uh, uh, confirmation of the level you have to take multiple entries uh, touch multiple uh, bone levels uh, uh anatomical landmarks uh, uh, 10 points has to be uh, uh, touched and then uh, the confirmation happens but what is seen uh, on the image and what we see there there is some error almost a 5 5 mm to a half uh, to a centimeter and many times if i keep at pars it may show at the facet so this makes me extremely anxious whether my screw is going on right track since i'm utilizing this uh, uh, technique uh, uh, on table and this much error I, it's not acceptable for me it might be right uh, for pedicle screw but i'm not okay the problem what they are saying that uh, when i do the ct it's in supine and i uh, they later on i prune the patient so that might be a uh, reproducing error so i don't know what's the right way to do this yeah no i think yes uh, this is this this can be a problem but uh, we need to check because uh, if there is an error of 0.5 to 1 centimeter if you are doing a cervical pedicle screw, you are in. You are going to be in trouble. So I don't know which company, but uh, you should check with the biomedical team uh, because they have to reset and adjust. If it is not accurate, go. Don't go for the instrument which you are thinking. The guru and uh, quick, quickly, I think uh, pre-operative CT scanning and then when you are using that in navigation, that is older generation. What you are talking about intraoperative CT and navigation, like say for example, IRO or even the OAM. That is current generation navigation. So right now, what you're describing is probably generation two or generation one, where you do a pre-operative CT. The pre-operative CT works well with the robotic if you're combining it with, say, Maser or Maser X, where a pre-operative CT is run. But for navigation and non-robotic, I think intraoperative CT is what is currently uh, the standard of uh, or would be the best choice to go with.
because after putting the mirror we always check all the instrument and it has to be accurate accurate there is no question. i think 0.5 uh, to 1 oh. cm is a huge margin of error yeah. and i think in spine it's not accepted at all actually yeah, yeah. Uh, dheeraj uh, if we have to depend upon the pre op ct there has to be two things very precise one is you have to take 1 mm ct cuts that is very important if you want to depend upon the pre op ct scan if you have more than that uh ct cuts are not uh, as thin as 1 mm then you are going to have error and the other parts are mobile parts like unstable spine uh, uh soft tissues and especially mobile cervical areas are you are going to have a more error with pre op ct scans but with worm it is uh, it's it's uh, uh, it it's easier because worm doesn't take as many cuts as actually as a pre op ct scan but because it's a real time intraoperative thing and it is actually registers image by itself with worm when you do you don't need to register the your image by touching 10 points so it it doesn't need a registration because you are taking a worm with a uh, basically already a, a, a pre uh, optical uh, balls already into it so you don't need to register it with a worm but pre operative ct scan if you are depending on that then you have to have very very thin ct scans that is very important yeah i think uh, any other questions to ajay or we move on to harpreet's uh, interesting case yes sir so i'll share my screen yeah dr harpreet is practicing at kanpur and he is one of the uh, eminent and prominent spine surgeon from north india over to you harpreet so thanks a lot uh, actually i am uh, i think will be the junior most and i am going to present a very simple basic case and i would like to actually learn what went wrong and uh, what could i have corrected so i'll tell it like a story so just uh, bear with me for 10 minutes only so this is a 23 year old sir i am audible now hey yeah, you are audible yeah so uh, she is a 20 share your slides Please share your screen yes yes so she is a 23 year old female sir uh, she is a graphic designer by profession so she types a lot and uh, she is a lactating mother of 11 month old daughter and uh, she presented to us with neck pain for 4 months and uh, she developed bilateral hand clumsiness and gait instability for last 10 days so now she's you not shared your slides we are not seeing your slide we are seeing only your uh, your camera photo Oh, no, I have shared. Just a minute. I have shared my screen. I think new share. Uh, try new share. Okay. So I have shared the screen. We can see your uh, image. Now, we, uh, now, now we are. Seen, yeah. Now yes. we are. Yeah. Right now. now it is. Here. Okay. Yes. Go to screen. Uh, full screen, and you can continue. Yes. Yes. I am going to full screen. And uh, so. this i have already told you she had yeah. a neck pain for 4 months bilateral hand clumsiness and now she is not able to design the posters which which she designed and all her umn signs are positive in both upper and lower limbs so we suspected some pathology in cervical spine and got the mri done so this was the mri we got and uh, here you can see she had a c5 collapse with a epidural abscess so most likely we got we think about tb so we thought it's a tb and because she is developing a progressive kyphotic deformity and uh, neuropathy so we wanted to operate but she told us that she is having some abdominal pain also so this story is full of surprises so then we before operating her we got her ultrasound abdomen then just because she was telling some abdominal pain and we found out that she is 7 month pregnant as Six to seven months pregnant, which she didn't knew even because she was lactating, so she was not using contraception. So she got pregnant. She didn't knew about it. So now we have a lady who is seven months pregnant with this uh, MRI picture, and uh, she is also developing progressive neuro deficit. The other one more problem is there that her her husband has four daughters. This is the second marriage, and child is precious because they think this will be the boy, so they don't want to take the risk about pregnancy also. But I convince them that you know this is the chance we have to go in and operate, and uh, so so we went in and operated. See, we positioned the patient 
and then you see on Siam pictures we get a very nice alignment on positioning. And if you see the C4 and C5 end plates look almost normal. So we went ahead. The plan was to do a C5 corpectomy, stabilize, and uh, put the plate in so that we can uh, rid of a neurological deficit. So we went in, put the cage in. So intro up. This is the intro up picture of the cage. It looks uh, good to me. So I would like the others to comment if there is any problem. They can see on AP view also. It looked good to me. We filled up with the uh, iliac crest graft, and then we applied a plate. So this was the post op picture. immediate post op so on immediate post op she actually did very well her hand numbness improved her gait uh, disability improved and we started her on att because we only diagnosed so she was not taking att before we started att after uh, at the time of discharge and we said uh, we sent her home with the advice that she takes at least 3 to 4 weeks bed rest so that with the collar so that at least att should work and you know uh, this uh, implant should be protected because the above and lower disc were little soft because the uh, tv involves the adjacent segments also so but then she everything was okay but she presented to me after one month with again the complaints of hand numbness and uh, uh, increasing hand numbness in, and uh, neck pain so that was the picture she presented with so this is the x ray of uh, october we operated her on september 2017 so this is october 2017 picture and this uh, when i look at this x ray i just i got scared a uh, scared a lot because it was my initial practicing days and uh, i gave her the option of immediately revising it uh but uh, because her pregnancy was now one month more so they wanted to wait it out because she has only hand numbness she still did not developed any full blown deficit so they wanted to wait it out i was worried that these screws may become loose they may cause esophageal perforation this cage may tilt more and cause uh, quadriplegia i was worrying like anything but they were little cool about it so and i got to know that patient was traveling on bike on second third day and going to the work for the, you know uh, uh, she was uh, again back to work on second third day because pain was gone so she she thought everything is okay and she was traveling in bike on one week or 10 days i don't know it failed because of that or because the upper discs and plates were soft and i was not able to recognize that on uh, uh, while operating at, at the time of operating i felt that it's not uh, i had a very good Uh, hold in uh, with the cage cage was stable but somehow so we passed two months more so this is the december x ray the next x ray and uh, everything remained there so plan was to once her delivery happens the plan was to remove the plate and revise the cage so three months passed i operated her in september in december last week her delivery happened and again it was a girl so they she, they didn't got the boy so that was the fifth girl they had uh, unlucky and as they say but uh, what sir in, at this point i want to know four months have passed i was planning to revise the cage and remove the plate so i went in from opposite side decide deciding to Uh, uh remove the cage and revise it maybe do a corpectomy till corpectomy of the four also and put a cage from 3 to uh 6 but i went in i was only able to remove the plate so the so the cage was rock solid so i called up uh, dr ajay shetty sir i told that this is the thing and you know the cage is not moving at all i had discussed this case with him before also but when he said i tried to move around the cage bird around it but it was so rock solid that on fluoroscopy it was not moving at all so i just removed the plate and came out yawn kar raha and uh, the cage was like that only so then uh, then i went in and did a posterior fusion for that lady put 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 a lateral mass screws and did a posterior fusion i think with that 3 months of bed rest and att that cage wherever it tilted it got stuck somewhere and bone grown and it became rock solid 
her neurological symptoms also improved by taking three months of ATT. And at the end of three months, when we planned to revise because we wanted to remove the plate actually uh, because of the loose screws and implant migration. So she had completely recovered her uh, motor deficit. So we didn't do anything el else. So this is now almost five years has, has passed. And because she was the graphic designer, she is still, she is the one who designed my OPD, uh, OPD, you, you say folder or maybe brochure still now she's designing, but she has not come for any follow-up x-rays till now. I have requested her uh, many times. So uh, this was the case which I wanted to present. At the end, I got lucky, but I think so many things went uh, wrong in the way. So I wanted to present and maybe ask uh, what else could I have done or what could have differently I would have done. I think, I? Yeah, I think uh, we treat he cures. That's what they say, na? give instability a chance. And I think whatever patient is fine, neurologically improved, and that is probably uh, what uh, the outcome uh, we should talk about. But uh, I, th I think you didn't do anything yeah. wrong in this. Uh, if we maybe see... In Maybe index surgery, anything you want to comment, sir? Yeah, yeah. so can I? Yeah, uh, just uh, just one quick thing is uh, maybe uh, if because of re retrospective analysis, I can say that okay, that placement of the cage probably is not uh, uh, absolutely what it should be because it is slightly going anterior. So it, it's, not, uh, it's not sitting on the vertebral body. It is going little towards the anterior end and uh, it is slightly posterior at C4. So that obliquity is little uh, worrisome because we, uh, we, we uh, if you bang it little uh, uh, posterior uh, on L uh, C5, probably that will give more actual loading at that level. So that probably was uh, slightly snug fitting was missing at that level. That is just can a, I make a comment. Can yeah, I make a comment. Yeah, you can go to the MRI. Go to the MRI. So here in the MRI itself, you can see that there is a front and back component to the problem. So you can see there is an infection maybe, here and posteriorly here. also you can see there is a problem here. So to begin with, you did a fantastic job. You operated, you put in a cage, you put in a plate, but I think protection was important and where the yes. patient didn't comply. So had actually you, I wanted to do pick up here. I think I uh, the MRI is very important here. Yes, I wanted her to take at least four weeks of bed rest and ATT because what I have, uh, this this is just my observation, sir, because the ATT involves the adjacent end plates also. So there is always an edimitous uh, body, uh, the superior one or the inferior one. And if you remove that also, that becomes a two-level corpectomy. And if that patient had taken three, four weeks of ATT before going into neurodeficit, then these and pits may be started to become sclerotic and more receptive of cage. Uh, just in the acute phase, putting a cage on the soft, I think, C4 body, it kept on going. It kept on in the destruction mode before the ATT effect could kick in. That's what I felt. But Harpreet, if you see this, uh, the screws were still holding well after the displacement of the cage. The upper screw left, sir. Uh, upper screw were not uh, in uh, upper, screw, I, upper screw got loose, sir. The C4 or actually got completely yeah, yeah. destroyed. Probably, probably that is also one of the reasons. And that yes. bike, what you are talking yes, about. Only this much bone left, sir. The rest all bone got destroyed. Uh, maybe. maybe retrospectively C3. But I think it was a very close shape for me. Uh, that was because you gave the topic like good, bad, and ugly. I think that was the no, idea no, I have. <laughs> Uh, yeah, means you did a good job. Probably that bike also is one of the big culprits because uh, she didn't take a rest. She, she was sitting yes, on the yes, bike yes, for yes. second, third day. Yes, she was She was very non-compliant. Till now, she has not come for follow-up. Till now, so That's like that only. Any other also comments? If just, also, if we just uh, see retrospectively, if we put uh, screws more towards the upper end plate of the C4, more inclining towards the upper end plate. Yes, yes. I think sir. the hold is screws are screws are short. These are all, yeah, these are all yeah, uh yeah. retrospective. Maybe yeah. longer screw upper end plate. Yes, I, I take all these points. Thank you, Harpreet. It was a wonderful case and a lot of learnings for all of us because we all learn with when it fails and we go and we retrospectively analyze. But 
ultimately the patient is doing fine she delivered the baby everything went or it must be a big mental stress for you when yes, you are yes. managing yes, every yes. day yes, yes, sir. and you don't now, feel like having food you don't feel like talking to your family members when something yes, yes. like this happens now she five five years follow up and very good friend and now and, business also we are i think that's that's commendable to you and thank you once again uh, we move on to the last topic and uh, it's how we manage a uh, spinal infection it's the last topic by siddharth ayer and uh, over to you siddharth uh, harpreet can you just ah, unscreen and share yeah i stopped sharing stop nahi aapka dikh raha hai ha yeah right thanks hmm. so uh, thank you everyone we'll try and make this quick i'll try and time myself so that i can finish in 8 minutes so uh, spinal infections uh, we'll just quickly look at rational of options of management uh, <clears throat> yeah my screen is visible yes so we'll look at rational looking at uh, index tb guidelines because that's what the who has prescribed so tb spine most common in india most commonly any age thoracolumbar thoracic and cervical are the most common regions so clinical features generally have chronic back pain constitutional symptoms often a deformity and very rarely uh, you can have deficit uh, imaging wise uh, x ray still the gold standard you generally get a paradiscal lesion end plate changes sometimes collapse overall it goes on to then develop pan vertebral changes with uh, wedging and collapse and you can often find spine at risk signs if there is instability but the problem with x rays is that more than 50% bone loss has to occur one quick uh, idea for everyone here is the index tb guideline says that an x ray chest hiv testing should be mandatory for all extra pulmonary uh, spine uh, extra pulmonary tuberculosis so that includes spine tb so quickly for spine at risk signs i think all of them what they suggest is a functional failure of the posterior column that makes the spine uh, grossly unstable and that's what we are trying to pick up so facet joint opening any retropulsion any toppling or any mal alignment on the ap x ray Uh, mri is generally your go to investigation of choice uh, early edema is seen on stir then you get hypo intense signals on t1 you can see cold abscesses in the pre vertebral para vertebral epidural spaces uh, mri also helps you assess the posterior ligamentous complex failures which generally precede the formation of spine at risk signs and spinal instability one common question we ask about or we get is what is the rational and role for biopsy yeah i think initially we, there was a more empirical based approach for tb but now i feel that uh, biopsy is mandatory for all it can be ct guided or fluoroscopy guided is fine either is fine accessible areas are definitely biopsy must for and if it is an oc junction or cervical if it's not easily accessible sometimes we can consider empirical akt it's important that you send for microscopy culture including mgit pyogenic and histopathology although gene expert is not recommended by who for spine i think we have enough literature that suggests that gene expert is quite sensitive and it gives you early indication of resistance so should be also sent so index tb guidelines we have now moved from the short course 6 month to 12 months so two drug uh, two months of four drug and then 10 months of three drug sometimes you might have to extend to 18 months if the mri at the 9 or 12 months does not show enough resolution i think you need to get the mri before you confirm uh, curative uh, curative uh, cure of the disease and stop it so some examples one conservatively treated so 32 year old female low back pain had rest pain l23 spondylodiscitis uh, large psoas abscess but no toppling no spine at risk signs very much early paradiscal lesion not much bone loss so we treated her conservatively this is x ray at 3 months and then again at x ray at 9 months which shows no movement on the flexion extension the mri is showing considerable resolution but she is still on akt we will again repeat an mri at 12 months before we discontinue treatment so summary what is the good ideal conservative treatment okay so clinically identified disease is early uh, she is biopsy proven so there is no dilemma in diagnosis she is ambulatory not much pain no spine at risk signs uh stability wise loss of vertebra is less than one no significant kyphosis of 30 degrees or more non junctional region adult not pediatric no deformity and no significant 
deficit. So these would be your ideal cases for conservative management. Let's look at some others which are for operative. So this is a different case, 48-year-old mid-back pain, two months history, quite severe instability pain, nearly one entire vertebral body is lost. You can see three pedicles on the MRI, but you can see only two bodies. And most importantly, on the AP X-ray, there is column translation, suggesting spinal address sign. So she was treated with surgery. So what is the indication for surgery in TB? The patients obviously presenting with significant neuro deficit, spinal address signs, which could include kyphosis more than 30 degrees, junctional region of a involvement, pediatric patient, more than one body, complete loss. Sometimes you need to undergo surgery because your diagnosis is not confirmed or there has been a failure of uh, uh, conventional treatment and you suspect that maybe MDR is a, a possibility. So this is an interesting paper recently published out of Ganga Hospital that shows a scoring system to assess which uh, variables are important. So uh, I would suggest everyone to look up this paper. It gives you a clear instance of instability assessment in spine and any score above three requires surgery. So pyogenic moving on to the other form. This is less common, only high uh, hematogenous spread. Uh, you should always ask for a history of interventional procedure, any GI or GU procedure, cystoscopy, colonoscopy. Any patient who has had intervention in the form of epidural injection, sometimes maybe high risk cases of developing pulmonary. They are more commonly in the lumbar than uh, thoracic and then cervical. Uh, patients often have predisposing immunity issues, diabetes, old age, HIV, chronic renal disease, steroid abuse. Clinical presentation wise, they cough, uh, they're quite similar to TB. So generally constitutional symptoms on, on the backdrop of chronic back pain. Um, so neuro deficit is generally uh, seen in a small minority, maybe, uh, you know, 20 to 30% might have neuro deficit at presentation. So importance is again, high index of suspicion. It's critical to identify the organism because irrespective of whether you do treatment conservative or surgical, you need the antibiotics to clear the infection. So good search for the uh, source of infection, blood culture, urine culture, and biopsy again is mandatory to send the samples for uh, microbiology, testing for culture, and also uh, microscopy. Uh, so you want to send the biopsy for gram smear, liquid cultures, because they have better yield. Uh, send them for extended cultures if the patient has been previously on antibiotics. Generally, you would get biopsy proven uh, culture isolates in about 70%. Uh, it's slightly better than TB because TB is possibacillary as opposed to pyogenic. Uh, sometimes you might have to still go with empirical bio antibiotics if, the, if you don't get a good yield on the culture and then you need an ID, ID specialist to help you guide the right uh, antibiotic. Features on MRI, so they generally increase signal changes. It's not pan vertebral like TB, so you get uh, mixed signals in the body, but mostly discal lesions are the most common. <clears throat> Quick table to differentiate the two. So disc involvement is more in pyogenics. Abscesses are smaller. Uh, skip lesions are very rare. Posterior elements are never involved. Uh, as opposed to TB where you can get multiple skip lesions, vertebra plana, or sometimes you can get posterior appendageal TB and the body involvement is pan vertebral. Just quick cases. <clears throat> in pyogenic, you don't have a guidance to how to treat because there are no level one studies. So most of our studies are level three. So there's eradication of infection is the prime goal of treatment, which requires antibiotics. Surgery is reserved for when you have instability or you have neural compromise. <coughs> Traditionally, IV antibiotics were given for six weeks, IV and oral. But then now recently, Lancet has published a paper which says six weeks total duration with two weeks IV and four weeks oral is good enough. This was a multicentric trial, 71 centers, 350 patients. So I think... We have moved over to now six weeks of therapy at uh, in my personal practice. <clears throat> so the indications for surgery in pyogenics, so neuro deficit, so sepsis, significant instability, patient with neurological deficit. Uh, if your etiology is unclear, you sometimes need to go in for debridement and get a good tissue sample. And otherwise, failure of conservative treatment is a reason. Okay. Surgical options generally preferred as posterior. We have a paper from Ganga. Uh, pyogenic spinal load is treated with adequate requirement from the posterior approach. Long segment fusion with use of bone grafts and titanium cages both work well. <clears throat> sometimes in select cases, you need a second loop debridement if there's a large pus collection. And sometimes in revision cases, you might need a vac assisted, uh, vacuum assisted closure for the uh, surgery. So you have alternative options. Obviously, anterior was more performed earlier, but now we are moving to posterior. Uh, 
minimally invasive options for like endoscopic debridement and lavage of the disc space is also useful when it's combined with a percutaneous fixation. So just a couple of cases, conservative treated. So this is a doctor, low back pain, two months following discectomy. Uh, Pre-op MRI had an L5 S1 discectomy uh, disc, did a discectomy, two months follow-up. She's got a lot of edema, uh, contrast enhancing <coughs> epidural uh, space uh, uh, scar tissue, or what you would say is looking like infected granulation tissue. Did a biopsy. Uh, we got good. Uh, we got a yield of streptococcus or hemolyticus treated with appropriate antibiotics. Four month follow up MRI shows good healing of lesion, and she is normal and got back to work. Operative treatment of pyogenic. So, a case. Uh, 65 year old L5S1 spondylodiscitis empirically treated with AKT. Four months follow up. No improvement in pain. X-ray from Jan to May shows worsening with, you know, collapse of the disc space. It's a transitional level. And so this was the MRI presentation. Uh, still having a lot of edema. Not sure of the diagnosis. Uh, epidural abscess also seen. Already done four months of AKT. So we did a intraoperative debridement and disc clearance and did a fusion. But as uh, culture showed, it was an MSSA. So treated with uh, antibiotics as per sensitivity. Two weeks IV followed by about eight weeks of oral. And again, five months follow up MRI showing complete resolution of bony uh, edema and changes. He is well and gone back to work. Take home message high index of suspicion. Biopsy is probably mandatory with the growing concerns of drug resistance and antibiotic stewardship. Close compliance for medical management. You need your ID specialist to help you out when you don't have a good uh, culture to go on. And generally, surgery is reserved for complicated cases. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you for a patient listening. We we managed in about ten minutes, not so late. Uh, Thank you, Siddhar. Yeah. Any questions to Siddhar? Yeah. Nice yeah, presentation. Would, yeah. yeah, I would ask. Uh, like to ask one thing. Uh, suppose you get an axial back pain. Uh, you suspect tuberculosis. Uh, okay, but in biopsy you don't get any finding of that. But still, mm. you strongly suspect it to be, to be a tuberculosis. Case. What will you do now? So, see, uh, as far as uh, when culture is negative or a, your um, your biopsy has not yielded or, uh, you know, anything to go on, then it has to be an empirical decision. And I think I always involve my ID specialists. If I feel it's chronic, if there are large abscesses, paradiscal lesion, no pan, no, no pan vertebral involvement, if the features go more in favor of TB, especially if the patient is not having any significant fever, counts are normal, then I would say empirical AKT is fair enough. But then I would always attempt because see, the biopsy is going to be positive maybe 60-70% of the time. So at least on 70% times, you will have some additional input from your microbiologist or from your pathologist to help you make that decision. If he, if he doesn't give you a input, that which happens maybe 30% of the times, anyways, you will go with your gut instinct or your intuition and then obviously make a calculated uh, guess with the help of the ID specialist and and still it is trial by error. And then sometimes you might have to change your strategy three months down the line, but then there's no other option. Okay. I don't know. Vincent uh, has raised his hand. Yeah. So that uh, two questions. One is uh, any role of antibiotic beads and vancomycin in such cases. And number two, you showed a case where uh, you treated a pyogenic with uh, conservatively. So apart from the IV antibiotics, do you inculcate rest? Are they kept in bed, uh, what is your protocol? So for the first question on the cement beads, uh, in the paper that was presented from Ganga, uh, we did use cement beads in two or three patients. Uh, our indication for cement beads are if there is abscess in the posterior paraspinal musculature, then we put cement beads. Because see, it's very difficult to put a cement bead into the disc space because removing it is a big hassle because there's so much fibrosis at, say, four weeks also. Even if you say that you can look debridement at two weeks and remove the beads, they develop a lot of fibrosis. So still paraspinal abscesses we do. In fact, recently now there is uh, some papers that stimulan is good enough and can be used in discitis. If, if that gets more convincing evidence in the days to come, then stimulan is a good option because you just leave it off. It anyways resolves. So I think from cement beads, I think going towards stimulan is one option, but still evidence is not fully supporting it. But stimulan gives much higher levels of concentration than cement beads, at least in limb trauma. Uh, the concentration difference of local antibiotics is in the tune of 10 times. So if stimulan seriously works for spine, it will be very welcome in discitis cases. 
Uh, second question was for the conservative treatment. I do offer uh, a rest because more so for pain management. See, all pyogenic spondylolisthesis have a lot of instability pain, and sometimes there is no way around it. I think fusion of a pyogenic spondylolisthesis is a norm. Generally, it will happen. It's a problem is how long the patient can tolerate that pain before that eventual eventual bony ankylosis occurs. So sometimes you have to say, see, you have to be patient and you have to. We are going to give you antibiotics, but sometimes response will be at least four to six weeks delayed. And if you have a lot of pain, the only option is probably bed rest. But I would still leave them ambulatory at least for washroom visits with some sort of an external bracing. But I would encourage them to at least avoid. day-to-day -day activities like work and other things at least for the first uh, two weeks of iv while they are still at home and then take a call how they feel on clinical examination and then take a call on return to work hi right, siddha yes if you have any experience with uh, using vac have you ever uh, needed to use vac in a patient with spine so pain my question too yeah so so vac i feel um, uh, at least in the paper that we published i think vac was used in only one or two cases but those were revision cases where primary closure was difficult um, i think recently now with better uh, at least in sancheti i think we are now using vac more often so any case where we feel that the first look debridement i am still not very confident that i should close this completely and i'm i am planning a second look debridement then i would always say let's vac it till the second look there's no point closing the primary wound if you say that you want to open it once again and if there is a high quantum of load at especially in pyogenic cases if there has been pus in the paraspinal muscles and if i'm saying i'm going to do a second look preemptively at say day 5 or day 7 and in those cases i will say definitely go for vac because it saves the closure issues that you get if you leave the if with the vac what happens you get a lot of good granulation tissue the wound also contracts considerably even our short duration of one week vac sometimes helps you contract the wound considerably and it's it's it works wonders when you go in for the second look because your work for the second look debridement is much less right uh hatita i am preferring vac in my setup uh, and my threshold is quite low uh, it's not about just wound closure for me it's uh, because these uh, pyogenic post operative infections uh, they keep on discharging for longer time from the wound okay and many times even after getting a sensitivity they still uh, keep on discharging and uh, which is not okay for most of us and so i use vac whenever uh, this wound discharges so even first uh, maybe without vac first debridement but when it comes second time and still uh, uh, i have to go again so after second debridement i put vac i close the wound Uh, loosely and i agree with uh, dheeraj if you are if it's a second look debridement and yeah. you have had to open him again for discharge then vac is 100% yes. sometimes yes. for the first surgery i would not put vac if i feel that right. i have done a satisfactory right. debridement right right i i will do the same right So, yeah, and it it all depends on the discharge also, you know, okay, whether it is it is coming constantly, then VAC really works. We have couple of cases, and it has worked wonders. Even stimulon, the advantage is you can admix it with various different antibiotics, okay. and that is I that is a good study. That, uh, yeah, that's a study. Uh, I will definitely think on this in my future. Yeah, yeah. So they are doing a uh, couple of papers uh, coming. Uh, hi, Siddharth. A very nice uh, summary of a very big uh, topic. Um, my question is: What in your institution? Uh, what do you all do for biopsy? Do you do CT guided biopsies, or uh, do you do needle or open biopsy? Because uh, I just wanted to know the practice that you all follow. So we, we do both. Generally, our fluoroscopy guided biopsies are about eighty uh, to twenty percent. Maybe only twenty percent go to the CT guided biopsy. actually honestly i prefer the fluoroscopy guided biopsy because a controlled environment patient under anesthesia or at least having anesthesia backup i'm not very fan, big fan of ct because you know you are working in the ct console sometimes sterility is an issue a uh, patient if it's a young patient who is who i can counsel and say this is going to be under local you will be wide awake uh, you will have some uh, you will realize something is going on but if you can tolerate the pain it's fine but quite often elderly will wince and move so much in the ct guided biopsy that it becomes a issue so i prefer for the elderly and op opd patients and sometimes it all uh, boils down to the money Uh, a CT guided procedure on outpatient basis might easily be five to ten thousand rupees cheaper if I, if there is a patient who is unaffording, who I I I say that you know doing the biopsy is better, and if he's saying no, I would want to do the, but can you shave off five ten thousand rupees? Then sometimes I say okay, let's do it on the CT, but then you have to promise me that you won't move around too much while the procedure is going on. 
Yeah, can I add up, uh, Bala? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, the advantage of CT, uh, uh, Siam guided or, you know, in the theater is that you can get a good chunk of tissue. That's a big advantage for, and you can uh, take it from the disc, you can take it from the uh, uh, vertebral body. Uh, the advantage of uh, CT is very specific. It, the lesion is small. Uh, if you really want to exactly take the biopsy from that exact level, then uh, CT definitely has a big edge. Otherwise, at times we have seen that the amount of tissue is also small and sometimes we don't get any answer. The chunk of tissue is better and bigger in uh, uh, you know, key, in the normal theater CT, uh, CM guided biopsies. I'll but, just uh, add... Yeah, yes. I'll just add one, two things. Uh, CT guided biopsy in our setup, the radiologists do. But if they have, if the, if you have clear cut pus or soft tissue, then the rate of success of CT guided biopsy in radiologist hand is much more uh, rather than a, a bony, you know, lesion where the he has to take a bony block because they use a finer needle under local anesthesia and they do not get the bony block. But if there is a soft tissue lesion. Or the plus you want to aspirate, then I think success of the CT guided biopsy is uh, very good, and uh, that should be the first to try. So thank you. I think that's exactly what I wanted to say is that almost ninety five percent of patients we do fluoroscopy because even if you do a needle guided, uh, the positive rate becomes starts getting low. So as much as possible for the juniors, you know, even though if it costs you five thousand rupees more. Um, I prefer to do it under either sedation or, uh, you know, LMA anesthesia and do it in theater because once you do a CT guided and if it is negative, it's going to come back again to, uh, you know, having a more definite biopsy. So for the youngsters, if possible, you can do unless you have a very experienced, uh, good radiologist. Uh, you, know, you need to have a really intervention radiologist or somebody who's really good at, you know, pushing the patient to be... Uh, you know, lying there to take that procedure because it takes a lot of time to, you know, position and get a good biopsy in CT in the CT machine. Thank you. Uh, Siddharth, uh, Hamsa, you both can answer. Uh, I am using uh, the uh, biopsies for tuberculosis discitis uh, for thoracolumbar region in most of our patients, but I have never been doing this for a spondylar discitis, post-operative spondylar discitis. Are you doing in this case also a lumbar L45 discitis uh, after yeah. three, four weeks of surgery? For uh, post-operative uh, patients, if they are coming very early, like they have, uh, you have identified the post-operative discitis in the first two weeks, then while you're doing, and if you have decided that you need to open and debride the tissue, then you can probably send the sample there. But if any patient comes to me with post-operative discitis where the wound has already healed off and I have, there is, uh, means uh, it's like six weeks and the previous uh, surgery has been done is and we've realized very late. Then I think uh, if you are considering antibiotics as your primary go-to care without the need of uh, doing a re-exploration, then I think biopsy is mandatory because it just makes you uh, wiser in terms of the antibiotics oh, you can so use. You are going with right. the fluoroscopic biopsy? Fluoroscopic, fluoroscopic. Okay, okay good. I think uh, we have to stop here because infection is such a topic. We can go on and on and on, and I think uh, Monday might just be around the corner. So my, uh, any concluding remarks, Sajan sir, in infection? I think uh, Sajan sir is... Uh, sir has already left, I think. Sir is there, but you can go okay, ahead. I'm here. I'll make a quick yeah. comment. I'm in a restaurant. Okay, I, uh, this was a very interesting uh, presentation. But I, uh, we have in my unit been following a regime for uh, frank uh, de novo discitis. Uh, we are very aggressive about surgery. Tell a patient that you will have pain, that you will have pain for uh, eight weeks and you have to be in bed. Most of them will not accept it. We believe in operating, we get the highest possibility of uh, getting a, 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 what the bug is. We know exactly what it is and we can treat it. Patients are pain-free, can be sent home. Even patients coming, sepsis can be operated and they recover much faster. Waiting for a tissue guided, I mean, a, a CT guided biopsy and all that, always I've found out it is a waste of time. But this is what I would do 
in de novo uh, spondylodiscitis uh, we will always operate we do not follow the ganga regime we have been following something which we have been doing very aggressively using implants more than 25 years back in the presence of infection and that's uh, now an accepted uh, regime okay uh, sergeant sir you prefer a cage or a electrocraft prop for anterior reconstruction i prefer cages and i prefer non peak cages i prefer titanium cages and i always use interbody fixation unless of course there is huge destruction of the vertebral bodies then i will uh, harvest bone from the iliac crest cancellous bone and pack a lot of bone and just use screws to support no interbody fixation no interbody so so sergeant sir and plates are gone so sergeant sir uh, irrespective of the disease uh, wherein you catch in so it may be an early spondylodiscitis or florid discitis which has lot of uh, body destruction abscess formation may it be any stage you would offer surgery for infection i would i would offer especially if the patient has severe pain and it is proven and his uh, blood markers show there is infection i will not wait for a radiologist to put a needle aspirate spend 5 to 7 days waiting for a report which may then turn out to be negative by which time the patient's pain would have worsened i will operate okay and uh, you know what i have been doing for the last 25 to 30 years and uh, your incidence of patients having pyogenic infections and you put an implant and the infection has flared up and you have to do a redo debridement or implant no, exit no, of your experience no, uh, as long that? as your fixation is good that uh, implant rejection implant failure doesn't happen of course if the bones are very badly destroyed and your fixation is tenuous then you have an issue but otherwise no okay 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 it discussions and i think it's a time where we are to the uh, end part of the spine weekend i would like to thank all the faculty and especially our chair sajan sir the pos sanjiti hospital and i would like ajay to take over What yeah so i think all good things have to come to an end uh, but uh, this spine weekend uh, next time hopefully we do it in person but uh, nonetheless we would really like to thank uh, sajan sir spending his sunday evening he was the first one to log in i logged in at 5:30 and he was there and he said ajay am i too early i said yes sir it's about to start at 6 o'clock and he was there at 5:30 he logged in and he was waiting when nobody was there so this just tells us about the you know love affection and commitment he has towards academics uh, even at this stage where uh, he is sitting in a restaurant with his family but still his phone is continuously you know with him he is listening to every single comment that has been made he is there so sir a big salute and hats off and we really proud to have a big association with you and uh, looking forward such association with all spine weekends in the future also sir thank you so much for being an integral part of this spine weekend and we would also like to thank dr shankar acharya for being the academic chair yesterday and all the faculty is all across india who really made this spine weekend a, a big success as dr shelle said yesterday there were around 2000 plus viewers all over the world and i'm sure you know with the today's uh, extravaganza with the talks uh, of the likes of dr abhay nene dr bala murli dr himanshu the great debates great cases showcased siddharth's lecture i think it was uh, everything sum up into one and not only the academic part but the non academic part was equally taken care of uh, i would like to thank uh, ortho tv for being an integral part of this journey which has really not only uh, helped us uh, get to doors of every phone or every laptop in every corner of the country as well as the world but it also helped us promote this event which we had planned so dr ashok sham dr neeraj bijilani a big uh, uh, thanks to you secondly our uh, support staff mr rahul chobe who was very crucial instrument 
in, in you know helping us with the graphics and all other logistic support and uh, our hospital sancheti hospital our chairman dr parag sancheti and the complete administrative staff who really you know helped us with this and uh, dr shailesh of course leading from the front uh, dr siddharth and pramod the dr pramod played a very important role in uh, i think getting everyone together coordinating with the faculties and uh, hopefully we wish to meet in person next year so thank you very much uh, have i missed out on any of the names please excuse me or dr shailesh can add to that you are mute you are mute dr shailesh you are mute, mute sir thank you thank you ajay for uh, the same and uh, i would like to thank everyone from my bottom of my heart and we definitely we'll catch up next year in person and uh, looking forward for a great uh, year ahead thank you thank you everyone once again thank you thank you well